Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the October 4th Board of Supervisors meeting. And uh, as customary, we will start with a moment of silence. And uh, we'll start out with Jessica, Vice Chair Jessica Paiska, and then Supervisor Sabatier has one, and I have one as well. Moke, did you have one? Yes, moment. I actually do. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll go through the line. Um, so uh, Bob Shaner was a, a teacher and a coach, and if you were in middle town, in middle school or high school in the late 80s and early 90s, he likely coached you. Did he also coach football? I think he did. Yes. Yeah, he did. Volleyball, basketball, science teacher, technology teacher, avid um, adventurer. He was always biking and running and hiking and really instilled that in his students, and he became a friend. Um, he volunteered quite a bit with the land trust and the lookout and um, and he was just a really special person and impacted a lot of lives. He worked for both Middletown and Canocti school districts and um, we're really going to miss him. Supervisor Slotkin. I was hoping to dedicate a moment of silence for Judge Richard Freeborn uh, who passed away last Friday. He was a uh, longtime resident of Lake County, graduate of Upper Lake, always reminded us, go Cougars. <laughs> um, obviously was a, a judge here in Lake County, um, made a huge impact on a lot of people, uh, was a mentor to many and a, a friend to many more. Um, and I think that he would uh, love for us to celebrate his life by continuing to be what he called community junkies, <laughs> uh, community service junkies. Um, and he's, uh, um, his uh, wife, Kathy, uh, and his three boys uh, continue his legacy. Supervisor Simon? Yeah, just wanted to do a moment of silence for a uh, long-time family um, in, in South Lake County, uh, Lila Parker, uh, the Parker family. Uh, they were the family that donated the uh, Middletown Central Park. Also, uh, she is my aunt, and um, we lost her uh, this last week, and she was 96 years old. She was the last of six sisters, um, and we're going to miss her. So, long-time resident family from South Lake County. All right. And uh, I have two, I have one for Stephen, known as Eggy Elliott, a uh, member of Scott, the Scotts Valley Tribe, um, known for his softball, also known for his philosophies. Uh, if, you knew, if you knew Eggy, he always had a philosophy to, uh, to give you, no matter what it was. Um, and so, uh, so he'll be missed, and uh, his tribe will be conducting the normal ceremonies for his uh, passing. We also have in, uh, in District 3 another uh, gentleman by the name of Dennis Heinrichs. Uh, Dennis was an amazing father, grandfather, life partner, and friend to many. He was a dreamer, an adventurer, and an eternal optimist. He was an architect, contractor, and pioneered sustainable technologies such as solar and wind power. He was a champion hot dog skier. Everyone would stop and watch him ski. Dennis had many life phrases. He raised his sons in a barn with livestock, was an executive manager for, for a Northern California development firm, lived on the beaches of Cabo San Lucas for years as the Zorro Plateado, and later moved back to Northern California where he developed a very strong relationship with yoga and Tibetan and Native American spirituality and was known as Kunga Dorje Gyalpo. He lived on the fringe and was a radical thinker, but he had love for everyone. He passed away last week at the age of 70 after a brief battle with cancer. Deputy Director, I mean, I'm sorry, Director Turner, CDD Director Turner, Maria Turner, would you please uh, lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sometimes when I say too many words, my mind goes haywire, like a Kelly Bundy type of brain, so I apologize for that. <laughs> All right. Uh, next is consideration of extra items not appearing on the posted agenda. Is there anything that anybody from the board has? Not seeing any. 
move on to our consent agenda. Consent agenda items are commonly non-controversial. Um, however, if there is something that anybody would like to pull from the consent agenda item, we can and discuss for the further time. Um, and also, uh, constituents and con citizens from the uh, public are, are, you know, if they want to uh, pull something, they can as well. So, um, is there anything from the board? And I see Supervisor Sabatier. I'd like to pull item 5.7, please. 5.7. For further discussion. Okay. Are there any from else from the board? Not seeing any. Is there any from the public? And I'll, I'll look online yeah. because I don't. Oh, I see one. Todd, I see your hand up. Yes, um, as Supervisor Spotke, oh, good morning, Chair uh, Todd Metcalf, <laughs> Behavioral Services. Um, I too would like to pull item 5.7, but not. Um, not for discussion. Uh, we just need to make some some edits to the document, and would like to bring back to the board at a later date. All right. All right. Thank you, uh, Director Metcalf. Um, is there anyone else online that would like to pull something from the consent agenda item? Uh, not seeing any, so I'll bring it back to the board for action. Mr. Chair, I move to approve consent agenda items 5.1 through 5 at 11, and with the exception of 5.7. Second. So I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And motion carries. Let's see. Um, we will now move on to our 6.1 public input. Uh, public input, uh, if there's something not covered on the agenda, you can come up and speak for three minutes on uh, any item. Just know that uh, um, we, we are not at liberty to uh, discuss that at this time. But however, we, we may uh, connect you with either a director, department, or even uh, with your uh, district supervisor in the area that way we can uh, see what we can do to get that uh, issue heard and addressed and so first I think I have um, one here by the name of Payton Keeney on behalf of Yolanda Wilson and so if you'd like to come up and uh, state your name for the record and we'll go ahead and go from there property tax issue that we're looking uh, Yeah, if you can speak into the mic. We're, yeah. We have a property tax issue we're looking to get help on a response from the county and uh, move forward with. And so, um, uh, yeah, so I'm Terry Sipaneri. I'm an attorney with Ewing and Associates. I represent Phaeton's mother, who is the daughter of Piedad E. Treadway, who had a trust. And... Yolanda Wilson, the one we represent, is a successor trustee. So she's been trying to um, marshal all the assets, find out what properties are in the trust, what properties were left outside of the trust. Uh, and as part of her job, she's been uh, attempting to pay any and all outstanding property taxes. And it's been uh, kind of an arduous process. Um, and today we're really here about one particular piece of property, and that is 14932 Park Street in Clear Lake. Um, my client, Yolanda uh, Wilson, is, is disabled, so she utilizes the internet, the phone, and her two daughters, which by the way look very similar, so it's kind of hard, um, people mix them up all the time. Uh, so that's why Phaeton is here today on behalf of her mother as well. So to quickly summarize our situation, um, Yolanda Wilson attempted to go online, find all the outstanding taxes for properties, including that 14932 Park Street property, uh, and to pay them. And she uh, cut checks, uh, sent them to the um, department, to the, the tax collector. Six months later, they were returned. Uh, and, you know, with a, what I think is a, a typical memo and saying, please contact our office, which she did, um, and um, was given information that there were additional taxes, apparently back taxes, owing for one of the properties her mother had before her death purchased. Um, but she had gone online, put into her card everything that was showing for her properties, made a payment, um, and that some of the checks were returned, some were held, some were cashed. They don't really know why, um, but it kind of came to, um, I guess, what, what Yolanda Wilson thought was a conclusion uh, because she spoke with a, a gentleman from the tax collector's office 
and was given a dollar amount significantly more than what she had attempted to pay before uh, on that piece of property in order to, to redeem it before the tax sale. She got a cashier's check in that amount, uh, sent it by certified mail, signature required, uh, got confirmation that it was in fact received. So that was a full month before the tax sale. If you can wrap Com up. Yeah, complied. So. Uh, to, to sum it up, it would, it would just tax sale. We don't know why, um, but they were told that the check, they, went, they thought the check hadn't come, but it was actually put into the file. So they okay. did have the check. So we've been trying to find a resolution, and I, I do note that um, according to the tax um, guide issued by the state of California, that if a redemption payment is received by the tax collector's office before the time prescribed by law, um, it overturns a subsequent sale. So we are we up, attempting to get that done. Okay. So we were told by the tax assessor's office to come to you mm -hmm. for some assistance. We, we just need to get that resolved. Where's the property? Clearly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, I think... Uh, uh, our problem is we have gotten no. We keep being told that. Uh, I think that uh, Supervisor Sabatier will. Oh, he'll he'll uh, reach out to you yeah, and. Uh, make those things for you, but we can yeah. talk and I can see. Yeah, we're just getting no response. It. Thank we, you. We've been told you know it would be resolved and applied, and it keeps being no re no response. Uh, like okay. we're s f several months down the line, and my uncle is locked out of his house now. So. All right. Well, thank yeah. you, and thank you. he'll be reaching out to you. All right. Well, we have another um, public citizens input request form from Natasha Robinson. Um, if you'd like to come up to the microphone, state your name for the record. And uh, okay, hi, my name is Natasha Robinson. Um, I'm not used to doing this, so forgive me if I get distracted a little bit because this is nerve wracking. So, first of all, I'm here today about the EVM Enhanced Vegetation Management by PG&E. Um, I feel that it's very excessive. They have a right to come in and maintain their lines, which they really have done a horrible job all over California doing, as we know, um, especially with the mosquito fire, I believe, but, uh, which is the latest debacle. But, um, yeah, they have a right of way. They can maintain that. But uh, nothing gives them the right to take any tree they want. And that's what they've been doing. I'm here representing the people on Wildcat Road. We've, uh, my neighbors are all elderly. It's practically borders on uh, elder abuse. They've been pushed around, badgered um, by tree companies that come and want to take um, just any tree that they choose to feel. Um, they cut 300 trees on my neighbor's property. He came and complained. He put up a chain, said uh, private property. They pulled the chain down, went onto his property anyways, and took more trees. I mean, this uh, is just, uh, I mean, trees are property. This is our property, and it's being abused. Our, pro our, our value, the trees are valuable. Our value in our property is going down because valuable, valuable large trees are being harvested and they're not in the range of the wires. We're talking 150 to 250 feet out away from the lines. And if pg e would just maintain their lines like they're supposed to, instead of having antiquated, uh, I don't, okay, bleep, you know, um, I had them come out and fix a line and they said, holy cow, this line would have disintegrated. Thank God, you know, you called up about it, you know, neighbor cut a tree, hit the line, tore the line out. So they came out to fix it. And lo and behold, the thing was just like a mass, a ball of bare wires. So what I'm trying to say, you know, when, when a tree falls in the forest, does it start a fire? No, it doesn't. It has to have those power lines. Those power lines are the problem. And what I really resent is that, that the consumer is getting this bill passed to us. We are getting charged for our own property to be damaged. We're getting charged for beautiful large trees, not within range of those wires. And actually, by the way, the tree has to be dead, dying, or damaged. They are taking healthy trees. I had an arborist come out, said those trees would stand. In 500 mile an hour winds, they'd be the last trees to go down. Big fir trees, 150 years old. They took them out. 
Now what? Now we're left with spindly, little, weak trees that are going to get blown around, hit those wires, and start a fire. And embers will be thrown down three, you know, 300 feet down those wind tunnels they've created. Start wrapping up. Okay. Yeah. The wrap up is that PG&E is not controlling their tree crews. They are coming out and taking whatever the hell they want and making a mess, damaging our properties, disrespecting the owners, and we are upset. And I do represent quite a few of my neighbors and other people on the mountain, on other roads, Salmon, Salmina Road, um, uh, you know, big fur roads being cut down. So I'll wrap it up. What I'm trying to say is who's going to help me with this? Because look, we're all upset. We've been upset. All right. So um, you're, yeah, go ahead. And I did try and contact you, and you, and you blew me off, rather. I, I, I didn't blow you off. I remember our, our conversation. Um, I gave you the, the number for PG&E. But if there are, so what we have to do is handle specific complaints one at a time. And so any property owner at any time, and this is what we've been saying for months, they have a complaint. They need to put it in writing, email it to me, and then I can send it directly to our pg e representative for the county. And that's how we've been handling complaints okay. um, yeah. for, the, for years. Oh, but well, I have, it would have been nice to have known that when I called you because that's not what you said. Well, this is the process. And, um, you know, Joan's been here every week. We've been talking about it. This is how we've been handling it. We talk about this at the Cobbery Council and Wildcat and Red Hills. That area is part of the Cobbery Council. So that's a municipal advisory place where pg e does come from time to time. Okay. But complaints have to be taken one at a time by the property owner, has to be written, and I have to be able to just be the conduit and move it through pg e to... Um, to get some help with that. So that's how we handle complaints, one at a time. I would, I would, I would love to see some results. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. And so I'm not seeing anyone else in the chamber. Is there someone else in the chambers that has uh, public input at this time? All right. I see someone online, uh, the Middletown Art Center, if you could state your name for the record. And uh, we'll, we'll give you three minutes. Thank you very much. This is Lisa Kaplan. I just want to make sure that you can hear me. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to invite uh, the supervisors and the public to come to the Earth, Sky, and Everything in Between exhibit at the MAC. It is open from 10.30 to 5, Thursday through Monday. It is the first exhibit of contemporary Native American art in the county and the first exhibit to be curated by a Native American in the county. And it's closing on October 10th. I urge everyone to come and see it. It is a powerful exhibit that will open your eyes and hearts and minds. And um, that's about it. That's about it. I just want to really encourage everyone to come and take in uh, the power of uh, contemporary Native American art and carrying forth uh, culture from ancestral past to the present and future. Uh, that's the Middletown Art Center located in Middletown at the corner of Highways 175 and 29. And again, Monday is the last day. Uh, we've been having field trips. Over 550 children will have come through the exhibit by Monday, and we encourage many, many adults to come and feel and experience the exhibit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. And so it looks like we have one more person. Uh, if you, Joan, if you'd like to come up and... Uh... Joan Moss, I am also on Wildcat Road. I sent letters of complaint to Jessica Paiska April 15th. I never heard back from her. She said publicly that she never received a letter. I gave her a letter again. And it took a month to hear from her again. And then I finally confronted her personally, and now we're talking. It's very important to work together. And I think one complaint is important. But look at all the trees. We are going to count the trees that are still, there are still signs that they have been cut down. We are going to count them and tell you about them every week. And we're going to keep writing to pg and &E. The woman you're going to hire, who is the consultant, I don't know if she's going to be on our side or the, or the county side or pg and &E side. 
She's going to charge $450 an hour, and she's not going to go to court over this. I read the background material. I think we need to do more. I think we need to protect our trees that are left. And I hope to get videos of what is left of Wildcat Road for the public. And we are working together now, but it took how many months from April to now that there is a complaint process and you're, of, you're aware that there is a problem. There is a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. I'll, I'll, I'll just say I've gotten hundreds of complaints um, through emails over the past, for the past over a year. Um, so it's, it's happening and I'm passing those through and we're seeing lots of results and, and you know, that's the process. This is a, this is a, a, a public utility company. It's not something we control, but um, we're happy to always elevate those complaints and hope and get I would resolution. have appreciated an email Joan, back. I got your complaint. I'm sending it to PG&E. Joan, you, you just said you got back. responded I, to, so yeah, I think I we can end this. Um, all right. Thank you. All right. Is there any other public input online? I don't see any hands up. Um, all right. With that, I will close public input at this time. And we will move on to our 6.2 presentation of proclamation designating the month of October 2022 as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month in Lake County. And Vice Chair Pisco will be presenting this item. And do I have anybody here for this? I don't think I do. Oh, you do? Oh, great. Yay. Oh, wonderful. Then come on up. Yeah. So, Board of Supervisors, County of Lake, State of California Proclamation designating the month of October 2022 as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month in Lake County. Whereas pregnancy and infant loss is more common than we realize, it is estimated in the United States that one in four pregnancies end in miscarriage and one in 72 pregnancies end in stillbirth and one in 200 infants die before their first birthday. And whereas many Lake County parents and families have suffered a miscarriage, a stillbirth, or the death of an infant during delivery or shortly after birth, and such a terrible loss is often not recognized. And whereas Lake County wishes to acknowledge the profound grief experienced by families who suffer the death of a small child, infant, or preterm baby, and whereas even the shortest lives are valuable and the grief of those who mourn the loss of those lives is significant. And whereas the 15th day of October is recognized in the United States and around the world as a day of remembrance and awareness of pregnancy and infant loss, when supporters honor these losses by lighting a candle at 6, 7 p.m. Whereas increased awareness of the causes and impacts surrounding pregnancy and infant loss may lead to greater understanding, support, and resources in communities across Lake County. And whereas recognizing Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month and Remembrance Day would enable the people of Lake County to consider how, as individuals and communities, they can meet the needs of bereaved mothers, fathers, and family members and work to prevent the causes of these deaths. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed the Board of Supervisors do hereby proclaim October 2022 as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month in Lake County, California, and encourage parents, caregivers, and all residents to become educated in opportunities to prevent pregnancy and infant loss and support bereaved families when prevention is not possible. Passed and adopted this fourth day of October 2022. So obviously this is not a fun topic to discuss, but it's a reality, it's part of our lives. And I've shared this before, uh, but I've lost multiple pregnancies and my first daughter was stillborn. So this is really important to me to build the community here so that we have uh, resources and support for these families. And I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here um, to be able to push this work forward. So I wanna pass it on to you. 
Well, thank you guys for taking the time to acknowledge this. I'm Jacqueline with Motherwise, and this is Leah with Motherwise as well, Leah Miranda. And we came in support of this for one. Every year we do, uh, well, maybe there wasn't last year, I'm not sure, but COVID, uh, an annual, we participate in the Wave of Light. So we have a ceremony on October 15th. It's international, so we don't set the date. It's always October 15th. And at 7 p.m., we invite families, if they can't join us in person, to, at home, light a candle. You leave it going till 8 o'clock, and it will literally be a wave of light across the world for all the families participating as the time zones change. So it's quite beautiful in symbolis, symbolic meaning. Um, but we have in town, we will do, we've always done it very small, and this year's a little bit bigger. Uh, we're gonna be at Library Park on October 15th. We're going to have some refreshments and really create a place of healing and hope for these families. I myself have not experienced a loss like that, so it's, I can't put myself in your shoes. I did lose my mother and there's that bond, so I can attribute to that a little bit, um, but we really want it to be an intimate, very uh, healing, helpful event. So what day of the week is it, Saturday? Saturday? Saturday, October 15th, starting at 6 to 8 p.m. at Library Park will be the Wave of Light, and we're partnering with Hospice on that. We are really making a push to identify all the families each year experiencing loss because they, they come to us in different places, whether it be the birthing center, public health, and so the mortuary, I hate to say it, but this is the reality. So we're really working to partner so none of these moms fall through the cracks and they can get that support after. So that's what we're hopeful for. And do you want to say anything? No. All right. I think that's everything. And I did want to go on what Lisa said open our hearts and our minds. You know, even if you haven't experienced a loss like this, hundreds. I mean, we work with t over 2,000 moms in Lake County a year, and I know hundreds of them have experienced this at some point, whether it's this year, last year, or the years before. And all of those previous losses, every time you're pregnant again, that hurt and that grief comes back. So we just want to make sure they always know they have support with hospice and with us if they just need the, the little support. I love hearing this because it's um, we've come a long way in this support, and um, I think we can always work together to improve. But this is this is um, this is really significant. It wasn't this way back for me, um, so I'm happy to hear this, and I'm hoping that there's going to be a significant uh, push on social media so we can reach all these people, and and we're happy to share it on our County of Lake page, and, and I could share it personally too because it's um, we've got to reach these families because it's so isolating and it's such a difficult time and get everybody together. So thank you so much, and, and please take the proclamation. Thank you. And it, I'll just add. You can find it on social media on the Motherwise Facebook page. There's an event page that's getting shared and flyers are going and it's all coming together quickly, but it's, it's together. And so just check there and you'll see it. Is there any other uh, comments from the board? No, I think Jessica did a great job. Yeah, good job. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak on this? All right, I'm not seeing any hands uh, in Zoom. And so we'll move on to our next item. And so our 6.3, uh, acknowledge September 23rd, 2022 as Native American Day in Lake County. Um, and presentation of proclamation declaring the second Monday in October as Indigenous Peoples Day in Lake County. And uh, I'll read this and uh, Moke will come up with me as well. We have someone in the audience too. Okay, Ron. Ron, you want to come up, Ron? Looks like we have an, an elder from the Habenapo tribe, um, Big Valley tribe, Ron Montez, who here with us. So uh, I'll start out by uh, beforehand just stating that I know that there's also some council members. Uh, I see a council member, Crystal Arroyo, on uh, Zoom uh, from Robinson Rancheria and Esther Stauffer from the administration. She's the administrator from Robinson Rancheria. I've seen her on Zoom as well. And so 
Um, one of the things I just like to say um, is um, there's, there's a lot of great things happening uh, when it comes to California, the nation, um, recognizing the indigenous people. Um, I know for Lake County, it's, it's wonderful that Moak and myself are part of this board. Um, we, we provide a liaison for the local tribes. Uh, and that's, that's one of my goals uh, as a leader, is to make that bridge. Um, I'm also on the RCRC board, which has counties that are rural, that work with tribes as well. And they often come to me for just advice on how to work with the local tribes. And so um, I'm really glad that I can serve as that conduit. And uh, I think that's been needed for quite some time. And so I just wanted to state that. And I know Moak does the same. And there's another um, indigenous uh, county supervisor in Alpine County. And of course, there's also um, Assemblyman Ramos. So just wanted to give those uh, insights um, and then uh, move on with the proclamation. So. So, uh, proclamation declaring the second Monday in October Indigenous Peoples Day in Lake County, whereas the area known as Lake County has been home to people for greater than 12,000 years and the richly diverse cultures of the seven tribal nations indigenous to Lake County, Middle Tan Rancheria of Pomo Indians of California, Koi Nation of Northern California, Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians, Scotts Valley Band of Pomo Indians, Habe Matalil Pomo of Upper Lake, Robinson Rancheria of Pomo Indians of California and Elam Indian Colony have informed every aspect of our community's history and whereas policies and practices of the United States and earlier colonial governments deprived indigenous people in the state of California and Lake County specifically of land holdings, liberty, even life itself and whereas the County of Lake is committed to protecting rights of tribal organizations and institutions to strengthen their own communities and Whereas Indigenous Peoples Day was first proposed to the United Nations more than 40 years ago, and whereas in January 2019, Lake proudly became the first United States County with two concurrently seated American Indian supervisors, and whereas because of our historic position, we have a responsibility to lead in honoring and celebrate, celebrating the legacy of all American, America's Indigenous peoples, and particularly those Indigenous to Lake County. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Lake County Board of Supervisors declares each second Monday in October Indigenous Peoples Day in Lake County passed and adopted this fourth day of October 2022 and uh, signed by all of our, our, our supervisors here, um, of course, absent of District 4, but uh, me and Jessica, will, we could probably sign on those, but yeah, we'll go for it from there. So, uh, so Ron, I didn't know where supervisor Simon, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. Okay, so if you wanted to... <laughs> it's always a, a good thing to remember who we are and where we come from. When that comes to Lake County, your indigenous people, my relatives, have been here for over 25,000 years, according to some archaeologists. And we have prospered through millennia of hardships nature caused and storm, heat, cold. And we've adapted to every circumstance and have learned to take what Creator had given us to sustain us as a people with no metal, we built baskets to cook our food in. We couldn't, we put hot stones inside the baskets to heat the water to cook our mush that we ate every day, made from acorns. There are such signs of genius amongst our people that I am in awe when I go to a ceremony and look at the regalia that was made representing our connection to the ground, to the sky, the water, and the trees, and those animals that sustained us and the plants that provided our sustenance. When I see 
the images that had to come to my people to sit and to take those and make something so intricate, intricate and so meaningful and so much of themselves into it, I sit amazed and so proud of my ancestors because they've given me courage, fortitude, and such, I'm so proud of what they have accomplished. And my hope is that I can take what they have left me and take that to my generation and the generations below with that same sense that I have inside of my spirit today that all of our people, indigenous people, who may have been looked down upon because they were not, they were looked down as savage because it didn't compare with other but in our own ways, we were kings and queens. We knew our relationship and have found that peaceful place of abiding in it in harmony with everything that was around us and, cr and treated everything with that same respect. And if I can communicate that to the generations below, then I will have lived a productive life that I could be proud of and to go home to my ancestors and say that I've done well. And so I appreciate this day of recognizing what we have always been here before there was a California, before there was a United States. And we'll probably be here well, if anything else happens, we're all going to go together. So <coughs> We're stuck together. We need to support and stand as one people now united upon this earth. And so I thank you for this moment for me just to share my heart and my thoughts with you. And may it carry something and spark something in your heart and mind that you'll remember today as indigenous and that there is something that was spoken that touched you that you can take with you and let that just give you a boost. Thank you so much. Oh. oh. Is there uh, anyone on Zoom that's a tribal leader that would like to state anything? I know we had a couple on there. Is there anyone? Well, I don't. It, if you are, please raise your hand. If not, uh, we'll count to five. Four, three. I don't see him. Two, one. All right. I think uh, Supervisor Simon. Amani Kalaktak Mok Simon. Hello, my name is Mok Simon speak our Kotsa Tao language today in honor of the indigenous people here in Lake County. And I know each and, one, each and every one of us carry on that tradition that's been passed on for thousands of years. But I was blessed today by the elders' words. As we do, we walk in two worlds, as EJ said, both here serving our community as a whole and also our tribal nations. But we have become educators and, you know, I take that to heart. Every chance I have an opportunity to educate folks uh, across the country and here in Lake County of what the indigenous people have endured, but also how resilient we are. So today is a proud day. Obviously, September 23rd is another great day in the state of California uh, for Native American Day. I know all of our tribes went and participated at the state capitol, um, you know, proudly displaying our flags and going through that. But the Indigenous Day on Monday is just one more recognition that we need to continue in our fight and struggle to educate folks of the indigenous people of this country. So today I'm honored. I want to thank the county leadership, uh, this board, 
and previous administrations as we came on board to really acknowledge these things. So thank you very much. I'm greatly honored. And once again, every time I can stand in the presence of an elder, it's a blessing. So, Ron, thank you very much. Chair Crandall, uh, I know that we do have uh, Esther Stauffer uh, in the attendees. Uh, not sure if she wants to speak, but that's the, the one that I can find. Yes, Esther, if you'd like to unmute. Uh, there we go. Yeah. She's coming in. Okay. And then we'll do, we'll do public. Joan, Joan, one second. Let, let this lady speak first. And then. You have to unmute uh, Esther. There we go. All right. Um, in the meantime, Will, uh, Joan, you wanted to come up and say something as well. I am Joan Moss. I worked and lived and suffered with people on both uh, many reservations. And I just, Ron Montez is a beautiful, beautiful speaker. But I wanted to say that I believe that he started out and was born at Elim Indian Colony. I learned that from my friends. Thank you. Uh, Esther, if you were able to unmute or... All right. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, hold that uh, and uh, move forward from here. But uh, thank you again, Ron, for coming in. And honoring us with your words and also um, on behalf of the county will you can you take the uh, proclamation and uh, go from there so all right thank you Vice Chair Paiska. I, I just want to say what an honor it is to serve with both of you and to learn from both of you. And um, you lead with your hearts. And I know this is a unique situation where we have um, two tribal leaders, or used to be a tribal leader, <laughs> um, on this board. It's unique in California. It's unique in the country. And it's really powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Sabatia. I, I, two things. One, Ron, sir. Um, you speak beautifully. Thank you very much for your words today. Uh, definitely uh, felt and heard. Thank you so much. Uh, and I want to say that while it was unique in 2019, things are changing. It is no longer unique. I was just with a, uh, I believe it's a commissioner, not a supervisor in Arizona, uh, where there are two out of five board members are Native American. Um, I'm going to say the county wrong, but it's the county that represents the Grand Canyon. Um, and so things are changing, uh, just like our Department of Interior is led by our uh, Native American as yeah, well. Th right. Things are very much changing in this country, and uh, uh, the ability to be in any position should be uh, an opportunity for everyone in this country. And yeah. Thank you, Supervisor Sabatier. And uh, it, it's, it's good to see that the country in general is uh, starting to become what it is. Everybody from all walks of life is serving in capacity for everyone. And that's, I think that's the ultimate goal. You know, so thank you again. And uh, if there's nothing else, I'll close this item. Um, just, oh, go ahead, Supervisor Simon. Comment on all those. It's an honor to serve uh, with each and every one on this board uh, throughout the county and you know, also inclusion, inclusion, the word of our time, everyone. You know, it was said from one of our elders, you know, we are all one here, becoming one tribe, uh, as I would always put it. But, um, you know, we go from there, inclusion, equity, 
those are all conversations that need we need to continue and I know this county is working hard to do that so I want to thank the constituents um, and also the leadership of this board so thank you all right with that we'll close this item and move on to the next which is our 6.4 consideration of a resolution authorizing application for grant funding under the regional climate collaboratives program as administered by the strategic growth council b consideration of a draft partnership agreement for the climate safe lake project and authorization of designee to sign and it looks like uh, vice chair paisco will be working with the uh, staff to to yeah. present this so this um this grant opportunity came to the risk reduction authority and a little late we decided to go for it it was um, in a conversation in july and we knew it was going to be a lot of work um, and we got a late start but um, it it just speaks so much to the work that we've been doing the work that we want to do um, so we we, we just committed to it. And so we've spent about the last two and a half months working as a, a big team, a collaborative with voices um, from all over the region to build this, this plan. And what's so amazing about the work that's come out of this is, is it doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't matter. It matters if we get this grant, but there's another opportunity. There's round two in June. But the work that we've done to build the plan is, is going to be our roadmap going forward. And, um, and it's, it's a, a lot of work that Supervisor Simon and I have been doing to build the Risk Reduction Authority, to build the collaborative, to be in the position where we could do this work. So um, I'm really excited. And, um, and so I'm, we'll go through the slides. So this is the um, California Strategic Growth Council's Regional Climate Collaborative Program. And so we're calling our project Climate Safe Lake. So this is um, this is what the program is looking for. It's it, it was created under Senate Bill 170. This is for building um, climate adaptation and resiliency through planning, research, capacity building, restoration, and sustainable infrastructure. And what's really important to this work is that it's community rooted, it's cross-sectional, and that you're building the social infrastructure uh, to serve all people. Um, and the eligible applicants are Native American tribes, community-based organizations, joint powers authorities, local governments, nonprofits, and organizations. And, and this collaborative is all of those. And and it, uh, it's for three-year term up to $1.75 million. And so we'll, the next slide is, um, this is our Risk Reduction Authority. This, is, this um, organization chart was one of the exercises that we needed to do uh, to prepare the application. And we wanted to make sure that we've got interconnectivity with the community groups, which are in the blue circles, to the center of the RA collaborative, to the, depart the, the directors of the RA, which has been expanded to water districts, um, watershed protection district, tribal nations, county of lake, city of Lakeport, city of Clear Lake, and fire protection districts. So um, again, this is just another really important piece um, that helped us all in putting together the application. So the mission of the RA is to proactively mitigate all climate or all disasters that are climate related. And the vision is that all county communities have the capacity to co-manage the many climate change related risks they share. So next slide. In, in May of 2021, we took the, the steps to um, expand the RRA. And we were, had talk, talked about expanding the seats to include the cities and the tribal nations and the water purveyors. But we also took the steps um, sponsored by the US Forest Service. Um, we brought in the CMAT team, the Community Mitigation Assistance Team, which was the first one done in California. And they came virtually because it was during COVID. And they did a two week extensive review of all of our mitigation documents and resources. They had interviews and workshops. Um, and at the end of that period, they 
they, they gave us this report full of findings and recommendations and toolboxes. And that really has become the roadmap of how we've been moving forward together. But the guiding principles was collaborate and mitigate. So work together, be strategic, no boundaries, help underserved populations, and proactively protect to prevent losses. So those, that's what guided us through our application. Um, the big question for this grant is, you know, a regional collaborative. What is the region? And this is a highly competitive grant. So there's going to be 50 applicants for probably less than 10 awards. Um, and when we met with the team from the Strategic Growth Council, um, they, they, they were like, what do you mean you're just choosing Lake County as your region? The idea that through this legislation was to build larger collaboratives and regions. But these are all the reasons why we say our county is the region. We are geographically isolated. Um, these are all things that we know and we talk about all the time. Um, but we have been left out of collabor collaboratives that um, could have been really helpful to us because we're not coastal and we're not valley. We don't fit into any of those, those um, boxes. And what we're doing is outside the box. So um, we, we, you know, we don't have the economic connection to the other counties. We don't have an inter-county trade. Uh, we don't have those things that those bonds that tie us to other counties and regions. We're our own air quality district. Um, we have the unique experience of being devastated by so many fires. We also have the shared trauma of those fires that have pulled us together. And um, and we've done. Oh, we've got this. Um, we're susceptible to clusters of disaster types. So we've got wildfires, flooding, heat, drought, and earthquakes. We've all of those. Um, but we're building on the success that we've been able to accomplish together um, by building out these collaboratives and working together. So that's the reason why we decided to, to choose the county, small c, as the region. Um, next slide. So when we look at the county small c as the region, that includes the county government, the cities, and all of, of the tribal nations. And what we want to do is build a climate action plan that is across all of those boundaries um, and can be co-managed. So that's our second goal is create the climate action plan. The first one is build the RRA collaborative partner capacity to plan and implement projects. So we have been building that capacity within the RRA, but we have a lot, we, we need a lot more to be able to do the work that we want to do. Um, the third strategy is the woody waste biomass utilization and bioenergy and biochar deployment plan. That um, we'll look at these in a little bit more detail as we go through the the presentation, establish a partner assistance fund, and establish a fire resiliency standing committee. So next slide is our first strategy. So this is where we really build that capacity. We know, um, we have to be very selective in this county when we, when we go after grants because it's really difficult to even find grant writers and this kind of support. And, and, and I will say that even to find the grant writer, Amari Rodin, who did this work, we had to look really hard. Uh, we had to find someone outside of the county. And, um, and it was, you know, a lot of people looked at this grant and said it was really complicated and they wanted to pass on it. But we did find someone who was willing to take that work. But it, it's hard to find those resources. So um, these are the funded positions. We're going to have a climate safe project coordinator who will work um, in the admin office under our climate resiliency officer who is going to be hired soon. And then community outreach coordinator and RRA collaborative support team. And those will be funded through NCO. That's actually three different positions. So the community outreach coordinator will be a full-time position who will be going out um, into the community and um, getting the information, finding the needs, bringing them back, um, and really being that um, more than a conduit, but that, that outreach. 
then we're going to have a biomass facilitator that's going to be with the Scotts Valley Band of Pomos. So the CMAT recommendation here is build local sustainable capacity for climate-related mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency. These are pulled directly from our CMAT report that we've been using as a guide. Strategy two, next slide. Create a regional climate action plan. And this is where the, the co-management of our land through a climate action plan to be developed for all the governments and by all the governments within the region. So this is all the tribal nations, the city of Clear Lake, city of Lakeport, county of Lake. So that CMAT recommendation was to work across all boundaries in the all hands, all lands approach. So once we have this climate action plan developed, we're gonna have priority projects that are gonna come out of that. Um, and that's where that capacity building of strategy one comes in. We, you know, once we have projects identified, we have to have the, the strategy to implementation. So strategy three is create a woody biomass waste utilization and bioenergy deployment plan. So this is work that Scotts Valley Tribe has already started, um, but it, it really needs to be continued and we need to have that connectivity to um, what's happening out in the, it, you know, in the communities as far as, um, you know, vegetation management, fuel mitigation projects, all of those things. This map is, um, this is a, I was really surprised to see this map. So we had a, the, the LIDAR presentation at the Risk Reduction Authority and, and um, that conversation was here a week or two ago. And the consultants that are putting together the LIDAR package did satellite data. And this is the loss of vegetation between 2020 and 2022 in our county from satellite data. And I can tell you that the, the south half of the county, that data lines up exactly with the CAL FIRE flyover data. So this has been pulled from satellites. It, the caveat is it hasn't been ground truthed. But like I said, the first, the bottom half of the picture, it looked, exactly lines up with what we've been getting the data with tree mortality. So this, this is, um, this is significant. This is, we all know that we have um, this problem with fuels and dying trees and um, all the mitigation work that we have to do, and we don't have a disposal strategy. So that's what this, um, this third strategy is for. And the CMAT recommendation was in the report, identify biomass disposal needs and expand resources. Okay, strategy four is establish a partner assistance fund. Grant writing support, I talked about that. You know, we, we don't have equity across the board when it comes to um, community groups, organizations, you, you know, trying to get grants to do the work that needs to be done. And so we need to figure out how to solve that. And so this, that's what this partner assistance fund is. Grant writing support, project development and implementation support, meeting facilitation, data collection, and up to 15% of the grant funds can be set aside for projects that are yet to be determined or identified in our climate action plan. So it does leave us with that room um, to kind of, to take in uh, what we learn and to plan using, using those points. So the CMAT recommendation here was partner with existing groups to apply for and administer mitigation grants for the community. And then strategy five is establish a risk reduction authority fire resiliency standing committee. This is something that we, we did at our last risk reduction meeting. And this, um, this is gonna be facilitated by CLERC. This is something CLERC has been working on, thinking about, you know, we've, we've just really been thinking about all of these things for the last couple of years. How do we keep our, our CWPP um, a living document? How do we implement the projects that are in there? You know, how do we update that? And so this is what's come out of that conversation. So clerk will be meeting with the, they, this committee will meet with the Fire Safe Council that, that meets monthly. And this is again to kind of take down those silos, reduce redundancy, um, get everybody together. So these meetings are gonna rotate throughout the region so that each region 
communities have direct impact on or direct input on um, those wildfire protection plan projects. So there's going to be partner updates, events, outreach, and the CWPP project um, planning. And this was, again, a CMAT recommendation, assign responsibility for the CWPP monitoring, oversight, implementation, tracking, and collaborative revisions and updates. So this was a need that we have been trying to figure out how to um, meet. And through many, many conversations and meetings, we've, we've kind of gotten to this plan. So the structure of the grant is um, the managing stakeholder will be the county. And the reason we have the county as the managing stakeholders because we're bringing on this climate resiliency officer and the county's gonna be responsible for the fiscal and grant reporting. Um, and that's gonna be through that climate officer. And then also um, that climate officer and the staff person who's written into this grant will be working with the consultant to develop that climate action plan and going out to all the communities and, and governments and, and you know, re really getting everybody's feedback um, before adoption. We're gonna follow that, the CWPP update um, process that we've been doing. Um, so that the county's gonna hold that part of the project. The co-applicants, the risk reduction authority is going to be the implementation body um, the collaborative that, um, that makes the decisions on where the funding will go, although the county will hold the funding. Um, and then Scotts Valley will take on the biomass utilization plan. North Coast Opportunities is gonna be the capacity support for the grant strategies. And Clerk is going to take the fire resiliency standing committee and CWPP update or implementation. So that's how the workflow will go. And then these are all the letters of support that we're getting um, after the fire, Blue Ribbon Committee, Tara, Clerk. American Red Cross has a community risk reduction program right now, which is pretty incredible. There are eight, eight communities in the country that have been chosen for this proactive work through American Red Cross. So they've built a team and Lake County was chosen um, as one of those eight. And so they're working, they're a partner on this too. We've got North Coast Opportunities and then we have our state and federal electeds supporting this. And then our last slide is I just wanna give a huge thank you to this grant development team. I can't even tell you how many hours per week we put into this since um, probably the beginning of August. So Mari, Mari Roden, was our, is our grant writer and she lives in Ukiah and she accepted this task and um, really, um, you know, I, I don't think we could have asked for a better partner here. This, um, this grant was funded through our admin office uh, because this is work that's going to be aligning with, uh, with our climate officer. So North Coast Opportunities, Scotts Valley Band of Pomos, Middletown Rancheria, the environmental directors were at these meetings frequently, American Red Cross, um, Clear Lake Environmental Research Center, Stiegler Springs, City of Lakeport and City of Clear Lake both sent representatives to multiple meetings and their feedback is also incorporated in this. So it's pretty incredible. And then our administration office um, just did a lot and really grateful for all that work. So that is my presentation and take questions or comments or what? Just a quick clarification. You said this grant was funded by the County of Lake. Can you explain what that means? $5,000 for the grant writer, is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. okay. Came out of yeah. the admin office. Okay. I, I wasn't quite clear on what that meant. Supervisor yeah. Simon? Yeah. I, I just want to thank you know all the volunteer organizations. As you know, the Lake County Risk Reduction Authority, when it was created as a JP here in the county, was was, was some heavy lifting, and I obviously need to thank Anita Grant, uh, former CAO, uh, but it was a you know a vision of the board that was brought together. So we've taken a lot of strides and steps. Uh, this is just one more. Uh, having a climate action plan is so important right now. Uh, as we move forward over the next decades you know, that we're going to be dealing with issues, as we all know, that are affecting us every day, you've got to have a plan in place. This board has been 
uh, long-term vision with, uh, you know, we're doing our road management plan. We're putting all these other plans together as we move forward. Um, our, uh, you know, our, our green energy resilience plan as we're moving forward. Some of those things we just talked about in the budget. But this is just one more big step that's going to help us move forward. I also want to highlight that the CMAT process that we went through was the first one in California's history uh, to be done. And um, that was a lot of work. I want to thank all the organizations, everyone who did the interviews. That was like a two-week process of meetings every day on how we're going to build this collaborative. So each and every month, you know, that we meet, that we have these conversations, we're constantly trying to implement that CMAT plan and move forward. And this is just one more step in that process. We've been successful with the resiliency officer grant that we got through the Jumpstart program. And over the next, you know, 24 months, hopefully we're just going to continue this hard work. So I want to thank everybody. Obviously, Jessica, I want to thank you for your just dedication on this one. Like you said, it was we were told, nope, can't do it, not enough time, but uh, it, at least it's here at the board for the discussion, and um, hopefully we are successful. I think we're starting to do a good job of position Lake County of uh, being our own region, because it is. It's very frustrating, uh, you know, on the LIDAR conversation. They, they, it was just approved for the North Coast, but we're not part of the North Coast. We're not part of the Valley, as Jessica said. And really putting the eye on Lake County in this unique area that we live in is so important. So, you know, obviously in complete support of this um, as we move forward. Also looking uh, to help us just keep implementing the CMAT um, conversations that were had for for years how do we continue this work boots on the ground and it's not the county doing the heavy lifting when the cmat came through we are here as the organization with the jpa to support all the organizations doing the work on the ground that is our firewise communities that's our fire safe councils all of these things that have been developed here in lake county to do the work that needs to be done each and every community member which we have a lot of dedicated folks out there doing work communicating with their neighbors understanding what needs to be done to help protect all of us so um, hopefully we'll uh, be able to move this forward today uh, and hopefully we're successful but the work's not done once it's passed it just begins and obviously uh, throughout the process while this is being analyzed we'll continue to just talk to the right partners and try and move this thing forward so the great thing that I love up there that I've seen is the collaboration all the governments in the county all the organizations working together and that's something it is. you know I'm telling you we're starting to really get that message out there that you can't do this alone you can't do it as a county government it's got to be everybody together and that is the collaboration and the you know the equity conversation that we're having uh, each month um, so yeah uh, that's that's what I have to say today so thank you okay, thank you Supervisor Spati. So the application itself, um, or the grant itself, I think has a lot of merit. Um, we need to be better positioned to deal with the future and the things that we know are coming or the things that we're not quite certain are coming. We need to be better positioned. We've all uh, obviously, in hindsight, have been trying to catch up uh, and dealing with the changes in our climate rather than being prepared and, and set up for dealing with the worst of the worst. Um, even though I think that uh, we're always going to have to deal with the steps back. Um, we saw what happened in Florida. Uh, they've upgraded I don't know how many times because of all the storms that they've dealt with. We're going to upgrade how many times because of the fires that we deal with and it's still going to be an impact when we have fires in the future. So uh, there's, there's no solution but we can mitigate. Uh, the impacts for sure. Uh, so, so these are important. Um, what, what I do have some problems with, and it's highly a huge concern for me, is what is the level of capacity that we're asking staff? Because I get very confused as to where the line ends for the RRA and when the line starts for the county. There's a lot of blur in between. And we have a grant as a county for a resiliency officer. Um, and it just seems like, is that officer supposed to work for the county? Is that officer supposed to work for the RRA? Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, overlap. And then inside the um, resolution that we're looking at, it says county staff will, pro or county will provide staff up until the end of the grant. But there's no, 
I guess there's no limitations. It just seems like we're supposed to uh, say yes without actually knowing exactly what we're saying yes to. There's highlighted strategies and there's highlighted programs, but I don't see the grant application to know exactly what we're promising. Um, I, I have concerns about creating a group that comes from an RRA that I don't know what the back stories or the back uh, the, the, the conversations are because I can't get there because uh, that would be a Brown Act violation. But like for example, I pulled 5.7 today because we didn't go out to bid. Uh, we say we want to work with everybody, but this is a very specific group of people that will be part of this grant with what I believe are promises to give them money rather than going through an open RFP process to say, are you going to be the one to help us with uh, doing these activities that we would like to align with in this grant? Because um, I don't know that they are the best um, position folks and maybe if we did an RFP we would know because that's what the RFP process is all about is to have transparency and to be aware of, of what's happening. Uh, I, I have respect for every single group that's on there from NCO to clerk uh, to Scotts Valley Band, Pon Pomo, um, Scotts Valley Band. Um, but at the same time are they the best position to do with things that we're looking to do? Uh, I don't know but what we have in front of us is a deadline of three days from now to submit the application. I don't know what the application specifically says other than the summaries that I see. And I know that it's going to ask a lot from staff at the county to do something that I thought the RRA was positioned to do. Uh, and, and, and what I do a lot of times is I'm looking at uh, Supervisor Simon and myself are, are, are on a JPA for um, LTA and APC, and I just see some discrepancies, and, and I'm not certain I understand how the RRA is sustainable in the future without Lake County continuously um, providing staff or funding to make it happen. And I, I, I just, I, I struggle with this because it's already set as what it is, and I don't necessarily agree with how it's set. I'm concerned about the sustainability of our staff working on this, taking away from all the other work that we're doing. Um, I, I have my concerns on how the RRA is functioning um, because of the fact that it's so reliant on us um, to help them make the things happen that they need. And we need these things, but this partnership, I just struggle with. Um, and I, I feel like I have um, more open questions than answers and saying yes to, to, to this is, is difficult for me other than the fact that the idea behind the grant and the grant opportunity I think has merit. But I feel this should have, I, I don't know why it got pulled last week. I don't know what changed between last week and now because then we could have maybe had a conversation and brought back more material before the 10-7 deadline. Um, but I just, it's hard for having a conversation happening in a group that only specific people are allowed to be a part of and then only have a uh, day uh, to have a discussion about this on how we move forward. Uh, I mean, last, last week we had a conversation, or two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks ago we had a conversation about a lease for something that's in here. This was not brought up. Um, we, we have uh, uh, part B here, which is um, a partnership agreement, and yet that partnership agreement was not mentioned in the leasing of the land, which has everything to do with this grant, only to find out that they can't even do the project on the land that we leased them. Um, and so I just feel like some of this has not been vetted appropriately. I, I, I get it that maybe it was a fast track to make sure that we meet the deadline, but I'm uncomfortable with some of the details in here, because uh, it's just not, uh, it's not certain to me exactly what I would be saying yes to. So there's a lot to respond to there. Um, trying to figure out where to even start. Um, I will let CAO Parker talk about the county's role in this. Um, the RRA is always going to have um, county support, just like it's going to have support from all the other partners. 
And that is a conversation that we are having um, this month on the financial contributions from each director and each partner for sustainability. So that is one of the conversations that we've been having since we expanded the group. But the county will always have a piece of this because we're a part of it. And, um, and that, that needs to be a decision, not a statement. Well, we're a partner. We ha we're part of the partnership. So all of the partners are going to be contributing. But I will let CAO Parker talk about the, the staff impl impl implications um, on what these new positions will be. Um, you know, it's, it's not something that you're part of. And um, sometimes, you know, you just have to trust other people's work and, and respect that. And, um, you know, this... This is conceptual, and we're going to have a conversation next or in, in November at the RA about the Woody, Mass, um, Woody Biomass Project. This is the concept that we need. We need this strategy. We know that Scotts Valley is a partner in the RRA. They've already been doing a lot of the work, and so we want to, we want to flesh that out. We want to see how we get to where it implement, where implementation is and where it can um, positively affect our communities because we have this problem and there is a solution and, and everything in between is not yet defined and that will happen um, if and when we get this grant or as a project gets developed. Um, trying to remember the other points that you had. Uh, but I'll just pause and let CAO Parker talk about the staffing part of this. Yes, as far as the CCRO, or the Chief Climate Resiliency Officer, they will be working not only with the RRA and those different partners, but with town halls, uh, tribal health, medical, uh, the community colleges. They will be doing that outreach to not only educate, but to be informed on what the needs are in the community. So that's one single, it's one small element of what that person does. Because the primary goal, the initial goal for this grant, for the CCRO, is to actually develop a resiliency plan. And my thought process is that first you have to do a vulnerability assessment. I'm looking to Ms. Turner, because it was her great idea, uh, that will also help with the safety element, but also with the resiliency plan, and then lead into the information needed for the climate protection plan. So there's, there's many different moving parts to what the CCRO, it's not just the RRA. Mm -hmm. But that is the one and probably the quickest way for that person to reach all those different partners is in that singular meeting and being in attendance to that meeting. And the analyst, um, that's part of this grant that will be county staff that position was part of the, um, the Jumpstart grant, which we were asked to back out, but it's also a match to that grant. So um, that's why we're including county support within this grant as a funded position for three years, to go out, to, to be working with the RRA and be this kind of climate safe project man or coordinator. What were your other questions? Or do you want to add something? Yeah, I'll just add. You know, it, it, about the JPA, obviously the formation of the JPA, it, it goes through through a growth process, and that's mm -hmm. currently where we're at. That's where the CMAT, hey, you need to expand to all governments in the county. So we've taken one of those steps. I just want to, you know, just kind of help answer a little bit of your question on, you know, where that line is. Right now there is, it, it is, you know, there's support from admin office from the county, those types of things. I really put it in the same category of the Workforce Alliance of the North Bay. The Workforce Alliance of the North Bay were uh, JPA, where the county obviously is committed financially, but also myself and Jessica sit on that. I've sat with Jim Steele and on that board as it's gone through, uh, you know, a growth and also EJ mm -hmm. as we've gone through this process. So to say that it's always going to be supported completely by the county, that is something that we've, we've got to work through here. You know, since I came on board in my last six years when we joined the, the JPA, the Workforce Alliance North Bay, uh, all the workforce was sponsored by the County of Napa uh, for the Workforce Alliance in North Bay. That's how it was created. Now we've gone through a growth process where we've 
hired an executive director directly. And we have the own employees of the Workforce Alliance in North Bay. And, and realistically, eventually, that's where the RRA needs to build to. That is absolutely sustainable on its own. I think with the funding coming down through the state, other organizations, well, basically from the state, that's how it's funded through the Fed and the states for uh, job creation. I think as we move forward with this climate resiliency stuff that's going to be going on uh, over the next couple of decades, there will be direct funding that will be able to come in there. So there's a growth process, Bruno, that we're working towards. I think what uh, may help in answering some of those questions. We do. The Brown Act obviously uh, limits us. We do our best. We, we are going to be doing some reports here from the RA mm -hmm. directly to the board as we move forward so everybody can be involved uh, with that. But the work that's being done, we kind of have done it in a silo. I've been on since the implementation with the JPA as we're making and moving these steps. And maybe that's something we need to look at the board where, you know, hey, if you're interested in being on there, that we get you on the board to have those conversations. Obviously, that means it'll take you away from some of the other stuff you may be working on. But this is this is a big issue for the county as we move forward. So I don't think there are simple answers. I hear you clearly, though, about getting those lines drawn as we move forward. But this is a part of the step in that process to help us do those things that we need to do. And um, I know you're very data-driven as we're moving forward. Um, but I think we can bring clarity as we're moving forward here with each and every one of these incremental steps that we're taking. With the resiliency officer, with this climate action grant, and, and we may not be successful. So we might be back at the table in June and we can get those answers that you need. But you know, hopefully that helps a little bit because we are part of JPAs that do have financial contributions from the county. Not so much staff at this point, uh, but this is a growth process for the RRA as we move forward. So that's what I really um, just wanted to lay out that path. And it took six years for the Workforce Alliance in North Bay. We, we, we kind of made that transition about 18 months ago, brought on Bruce Wilson as the executive director. He got hired away, I, I think, from Napa is where he was working. And now he works directly for the RRA. And that's, you know, kind of standalone. So um, there's that growth process that we're going through. And it's going to be unique how it ends up. But there may be always a financial contribution of some sort coming from the county. But hopefully the capacity building we're doing here as we move forward with all the partners, it's not going to be a um, uh, where we have staff at, at that point. For five years, we got the resiliency officer. We're doing these things. So we have a timeline. Uh, you know, I would say we haven't done our job as a board and an RRA, you know, as we're moving forward. Um, if we don't have it set up to be sustainable in five years. So that's, I know that's a long ways out. I know that's not, you know, what you, you want to hear on this, uh, the easy quick plan. Uh, but I think this is something that's going to continue growing. And, you know, we've got to keep doing the work and come out with the plan in the end, you know, before the grants run out and these extra capacity tools that we put together. Because myself and Jessica can't do it. The county can't do it. It's all the partners. But we have those partners really building capacity. Uh, clerk, uh, the tribes, um, you know, the cities, you know, the city of Lakeport, the city of Clerk. They see the value in this. And um, I know... We don't have a clear path, but we got a path forward. We've we've just got to keep taking these incremental steps. So oh, we got no. work to do. Yeah, and I'll just add that the county did staff the RRA, and yeah. and we built that capacity with NCO, which we did put an RFP out for, and um, that's how we got that partnership with them. So this is expanding their role. With, with grants that we've already applied for so that we don't have county staff running these meetings and facilitating so that we have pulled that back um, because that wasn't the sustainable model. So it's, it's, it's expanding NCO's role, but we've already done the RFP. But that's already happened. We did that over a year ago, and we're, we, we'll be looking at other grants um, to support that as well. Um, the reason it was pulled last week is because one of the partners had a question. And we weren't going to move this forward without 100% of the RRA partners and members and collaborative on board. And so we just, we just paused, 
let them get more information, had a few more conversations, got everything worked out, cleared up last Friday and had that vote and we, had, and we scheduled a second special meeting to make sure that we're moving together forward. So that's why it was pulled. Um, and because we respect everybody's, um, we, we have never not had a unanimous vote at the RRA. And I think that's pretty, that's something that's really unique and special too because of how we work together and respect everybody that comes to the table. I see there's uh, some public input, uh, so I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add or, so um, I see public input, so if, uh, in the, I, I was gonna start with Zoom first, because uh, the hands were up like pretty, for a long time, so I see, uh, well, Betsy was on, but when she comes back on, I see 707-245-4550 uh, if you can unmute, and uh, we'll go ahead and give you your time and questions. And then, Betsy, I'll follow uh, with you after this, uh, this phone number. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. This is Elizabeth Larson with Lake County News. I just had a couple quick questions. Um, I'm curious about why these specific partners were chosen, NCO, Clerk, and Scotts Valley. That's my first question. Uh, my second question is, um, where are the eight locations for Scotts Valley's biochar projects mentioned in the partnership agreement document, and do those include the Red Hills Road location, the location on Canyon land in Upper Lake that was approved a few weeks ago? Um, and the last question is really more philosophical. There was mentioned in this presentation a, a climate plan that this group is supposed to prepare at some point. Is the county waiting on that plan before it actually works any assumptions or any planning into its own budget? Because the three, the 400-page budget narrative that, that was approved as part of the budget document a few weeks ago has approximately 10 mentions of the word climate in it, and nine of them are in the UC Cooperative Extensions budget. One's in the CAO's office mentioning the Climate Resilience Officer. Anywhere else, I can't find climate or climate projects or climate um, goals mentioned in any of the department heads' um, um, budget at narratives. So is everybody just holding off until the RRA comes up with a plan, or you know, why is that? Thank you. Okay. Um, did you want to take this up, or I'll, I'll do the best answer. The first question on the partners: um, the Lake County Risk Reduction Authority, since inception, has been meeting monthly, and we've had continued participation uh, from the groups, uh, clerk, NCO, um, Scotts Valley Band, from day one, been participants to the meetings. Obviously. Uh, you know, the tribal position was opened as we grew it, but these are folks that have been doing the work, the boots on the ground that have been successful, getting grants, doing programs. Uh, you know, the NCO obviously brought on board to help facilitate, um, you know, and, and also take on other projects, the home hardening project, uh, pilot program that's running in Lake County. Um, so these are groups that both participate in the Risk Reduction Authority, Lake County Fire Safe Count. They're always doing the work on the ground. It's not so much from the county standpoint, but it's the collaboration efforts together. So hopefully that will be able to answer that qu the, the initial question um, that you had, uh, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, as far as the rest of the questions, the budget stuff, I'll, I'll allow it to answer. But um, really for the admin office, the climate resiliency officer, it was spoken earlier that not only work with all government agencies, but also internally with our directors, uh, community development department, you know, our general plan invitation and updates as those things need to happen, uh, the climate action plan that needs to be done. I am probably saying it wrong uh, as far as the plan. Uh, but, um, you know, those are all collaboration things that need to happen. I think we're in the early phases of it. We understand, uh, you know, where the climate's, you know, where it's going. Uh, but this is early on work to really get that collaborative effort to not only engage all governments around the county and organizations doing the work, but also our own internal departments here at the county to be that communicator and facilitator as we move forward. Yeah, and NCO once again answered the RFP. They were the only 
organization to answer the RFP to, to be supportive of the Risk Reduction Authority. And we, we sent that RFP out twice. And um, they were the only group interested, and that was a year and a half ago. And so, you know, we're, we've been in contract with them for that support. Um, we don't have a climate plan right now. We don't have any of those required plans that we need to in this day and age. And so this is how we get there. Do you want to speak a little bit more about it now? Okay. Well, and I also see uh, Tom Jordan on from Scotts Valley. So I think uh, pertaining to the question about where the, I guess, the biochar plants are going to be, maybe you can elaborate, Tom, if you can come off of... Uh, can, can I just... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Again, like, there's a lot of detail in that um, agreement the, that we're approving, but from the Risk Reduction Authority's perspective, like, this is still conceptual. And um, the tribe ha could have identified those places, but, you know, they still have to be vetted. They still have to, you know, there's a, there's a long, you know, there's a lot of work that has to do to, to get those to, um, to the time when they're up and running. And that's why we have this facilitator um, funded through the grant so that we can uh, work collaboratively to make sure that this whole strategy that's being built out is going to be working for everybody. So, um, t and Tom can speak more. But it's, you know, we don't know what those identified places are yet. This is something that we're getting from the tribe and that will be um, expanded on and worked on together. Tom, I don't know if you wanted to come off of uh, mute or if you had anything to add to that about that question. And if you're having trouble with uh, unmuting, I can move on to the next question. And when you're ready, we can come back to it. Um, so next, I've seen Betsy Kahn. You have your hand up. Uh, if you'd like to unmute, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, hear what you have to ask or say. Okay. Okay. Tom, I've seen you unmute, uh, and I think Betsy just dropped off. She'll probably be calling back. So, Tom, if you wanted to go ahead and elaborate, uh, feel free to go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I think uh, Chairman or Supervisor Paiska has identified it correctly. We are at the at the stage of just locating and identifying locations. We have not vetted them. We have not talked to specific owners or organizations or agencies. So it would be very premature to identify all the sites. The two sites that we do know about uh, are, are the, the site that we actually own at Red Hills and the site at Upper Lake that we will be working with the, your board to move forward with. Uh, the other six sites, and possibly even more than that, as I say, have not been totally vetted to the point where we would be able to share with anybody at this point in time where those sites are. Right. I, it's it's more about the strategy because we, you know, it doesn't make sense to be hauling all this vegetation far distances or out of the county, and so having many sites within the county. Um, is going to make it a lot easier for this work um, to happen for these community projects, for um, all vegetation management projects. And, um, you know, and so that's the goal is to have a place close by where you can bring these things free of charge and drop them off. Um, you know, again, it's conceptual. We know this is something that we need. But the details will come in the, you know, as we move forward, whether or not we get this grant. This is, some, this is the type of strategy that we need in our county. All right. So I see next 707-281-6205. Uh, if you can unmute, uh, we'll go ahead and take your statement. Hi, this is Bart Levinson, and I'm going to very nervously and humbly try to say something here. Um, Bruno, a lot of what you said um, I actually agree with. I share some of your concerns. And uh, I want to invite all of the supervisors to attend the Risk Reduction Authority meetings, as I have done, uh, as Betsy has done, uh, and ask uh, the Risk Reduction Authority to explain more 
and push less. Uh, that what you're hearing today, I think, is the discomfort with how fast you're pushing this before giving all of us the information about what the project is. You're asking us to trust you. Well, I'm sure we all want to trust you, but we need the information about what it is, what resources uh, you will need to accomplish what you're going to accomplish, and where will the eight biochar, maybe more, uh, facilities be throughout the county when the Riviera already rejected one of them. So uh, just more transparency, more information, not so much rush. Uh, let's all get there together. Thank you. So I'm just going to say again, this is um, a plan that is conceptual that um, you know, we want to work towards implementing at every step towards implementation. Every project will have to go through a significant planning process, just as they all have. And, um, you know, and, and that's, that's going to be in the future. This is just, this is, this is kind of how we get there. We, you know, we need these things. We need this climate action plan. We know that there's going to be projects that come out of it. And, and that will be the next step is getting those projects identified and then figuring out how to implement them and going through all the correct processes and channels. Um, a lot of discussion happens in the RA and happens in the our RA committees, which are all public. Um, but due to the Brown Act, only two supervisors can be at those meetings. So um, that's why, Bart, um, all supervisors can't be in attendance. But there are um, representatives from both the cities, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they're reporting back to their supervisors if, um, you know, if they're not able to attend. Could you, have something to add? you know, I just want to address some of the timing comments as we're going here. A lot of these things that we, we are looking to go for, let's, let's go the Jumpstart program. That never existed. Yeah. before the first one we applied for. So it's not like something that's recurring every year. These are new things from the governor's budget that are being brought down that are available for communities that have risk, have uh, experienced disaster, and to need to have these plans. A lot of these things are new. They did not exist before. So, yep, we know ICDBG, when it's due every year as we move forward, these are recurring grants and opportunities to go in. A lot of this stuff is new. There's been a lot of back and forth collaboration. I would just say when the Jumpstart grant, a different grant came out, it was only to be in one area in the county. The conversation with them was, hey, can we make this the entire county instead of one specific area? So there's constant conversation going on as we're moving forward. It does. We wish we had a year out to really plan these things, but we don't. Um, we're going to attempt to be successful this time. We may not be successful. So we hear the concerns. The next time, if we're not successful, we'll take those into consideration, public comment as we're moving forward, and try and implement a little bit more. But there is a deadline that is due on this Friday. It needs to be in. We're attempting to get this in to see if we can be competitive. Uh, on this grant and see if we can bring this collaboration that we've been building here to Lake County to everybody's attention of this is what we're doing. So I just, to address timing issues, some of these things are brand new. And so, yep, if there's a round two or round three, we'll continue those on. And there is. So uh, the Jumpstart program has been brought back. It's been put out to tribal really on a tribal nation focus now. Uh, there was one tribe that was successful in the first round. Lake County was successful. But I know they're really pushing hard, too, with the outreach to the tribes of, hey, a climate resiliency officer. So we have seven nations in the county. Hopefully everybody's looking at it because that is another part of the work that can be done directly with the RRA. So there may be another round as we're moving forward with this. But this is, I just want to kind of address those timing things of, you know, we're being forced into this, but a lot of this stuff is new work being created. And you're so right. It is new. And when we had the discussions with the grant team or uh, from the growth council, they, they acknowledge this is new. And if things change, we don't, 
we just have to be in contact with them. They're part of the, one of the grant requirements is we have peer-to-peer -peer meetings quarterly with the other applicants to work through what's working, what's not working, what needs to change. And, and they've been very clear from the beginning, like if some of these things don't work, it's okay. Well, we're gonna work on it, we're gonna work through this. And there's gonna be another round in June and you know, a lot's gonna be learned from now until then about the whole application process and what they're even asking for. So um, again, it's, in, it's new, there's a lot to learn, but if we don't, you know, we, that's not a reason to not push and try and go for an opportunity. That's what we're doing right now. These are the things that we know we need. Here is an opportunity. Let's make a hard push and try and get that funding so that we can um, get to work on it. And so what I'll do is uh, I'm gonna call on Betsy and then Natasha after Betsy, I'll, I'll let you come up. Uh, Betsy, if you can unmute, uh, there we go, I see. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Crandall and board. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to re respond to this particular item. Um, the the uh, activity of the Risk Reduction Authority uh, and all of the planning that you're talking about, uh, Supervisor Paiska and, and, and Supervisor Simon, those are all incredibly wonderful, laudable efforts, and I don't I don't uh, discount them at all. I will say that uh, at this point, almost everything that you've done has been beneficial to a an entity and hard for the community to get through that process that you're using. Um, tonight you'll have the first uh, public hearing on the Community Wildfire Protection Plan, but there are several key issues that you could... We lost her. Betsy, we, we, we lost you at you could. So while she's reconnecting, the act, the CWPP is tomorrow night, the 5th at 6 p.m. So, Betsy, you were definitely right it's happening this week, but it is tomorrow night, Wednesday night. Yeah. And also, um, that's why there's a community engagement full-time position with NCO into this grant so that, you know, we can really get deep into the community and 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 to bring information back and forth and, and to deepen that collaborative. Betsy, are you still with us? If you can, no, I don't see, I think it came off. So um, while, while we're working on that, uh, Natasha, if you'd like to come up. Okay. Well, you keep on talking about collaboration with the community. We have had none from you or PG&E. And I wanna say, you know, you keep on acting like we're going to be involved in this, but you know, you haven't involved us so far, you know, because we have been trying to reach out, trying to get someone's information, you know, trying to get some help here. Now, I was wondering, is this wood biomass project, is that to basically haul away all the thousands of logs behind my house that PG&E has left and in the other communities? Because, you know, uh, we, they're littering our mountain with dead logs. And why should we have to pay for that? You, you don't have to. Okay, that. yeah, that would be um, part of the grant. And so again, what I need is, I need to know exactly what the complaint is from the property Yeah, owner. and you and, pass and it on, you pass yes. it on. But you don't do but, anything, do oh, you? Okay, so there another place, and, and we have this in the grant, is our municipal advisory councils. And so you are part, where your property is, is part of the Cobbery Council. I go there um, every month it's the third Thursday of the month at okay. 6.30 at the Little Red Schoolhouse. There are all of these ways that the community can, um, can interact, but, I ha but we have to get the information. And I think that's been the difficult part. I have not been getting a lot of information. I do drive down Wildcat. I drive down there all the time. And I, I, I'm not getting complaints. I see what's happening, but I have to hear directly from the property owner. And we did get PG&E to uh, bring back their, their wood haul program. Mm -hmm. And if you have trees that they're not picking up, you just let me know and I will make sure there's, that they get picked there's up. There's hundreds. Of I know there are. I know there are. property and it's, a, it's still a fire hazard. I know. I know. 
And um, that's not they, resiliency. That's not safety. And what about the climate? What about all these green trees? Can, can you ask all down? your questions in, in the no. three minute time frame? Uh, d where are we at? Uh, okay. I, I just want to say the Mendocino Board of um, Supervisors did ask the for for a halt to the EVM, and you guys could too. You guys, because you guys, this is about climate. Wow, really? You're letting, there's so many green trees being cut down right now on that mountain, on Mount Hannah, it is staggering and they're nowhere near the lines and you guys are talking about saving, uh, you know, the climate. You guys are letting a, a catastrophe go down. I, a I need to disaster. hear from those property owners and then we'll work on it yeah, one I'll get all time. of them. They'll all So fine. I want to give you this email. Um, pg e came a few weeks ago and they I gave have us written everybody at pg e several right. times. I, I think that I'm we're sorry. Right. I have worn out pg e I have worn them out okay. with no results. Then you send the email to me and I'll pass it along. And then we'll get the logs picked up. That's I've been working with property owners all year on that and it's really effective their new email address for um, tree pickup is tree safety at pge.com you. but you're welcome to send me an email and i will pass it along okay all right. talking about climate thank you, you. Can start by saving some trees on the mountain all right we're at your three minutes thank you um next i have joan moss if you'd like to come up joan and then i'll go back to zoom i have a couple more hands up John Moss, I have a suggestion for the committee that you make sure to mention that you welcome alternative opinions and you welcome the EPA Suffer Bank people, Carter Jessup, and you welcome the USGS. Because I have a problem with the word methyl mercury. And the EPA, they refuse. This Joan, is a conversation that is climate-oriented. Okay. They have refused to mention the word methylmercury in their 2021 update. And I pointed that out to Sarah. They now okay. call it... Joan, this is about this, the... This is Lake County, Mr. Joan, Curry. I understand, but I'm this is... I'm talking about... I'm about not, meth not methylmercury right now. This is about... There the, are... Yes, it is. It's about a grant... Yes, it's a grant that involves clim climate, climate problems. And the government itself is holding back on the facts. I work with Tom Zucanic. There were dead cats on the beach. I went down and I asked him and Pete Richardson, Did, was there a methylmercury involved? Oh, no, no, no. And then when he doesn't work for UC Davis, I asked him, was there a methylmercury involved? He finally was able to say, yes. We have problems that are being ignored. And the USGS is, is, is saying untrue things and not wanting us to know where Mount Kanakta is and where it is on the list. And that is a climate problem. That's one of the problems that I see is that you're not talking about all of the problems in Lake County. You're not talking about the volcano. You're not talking about the climate, the, the, the EPA cover-up. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. And I, I urge you to attend the risk reduction authority meetings as um, other supervisors like myself and Supervisor Sabatia cannot attend, but we can read the minutes or watch the video if there is one. Joan, you, you're free to attend those meetings and give your insight. And the other thing I'll, I'll mention is um, I just want to make sure that folks note this, that I, I'm not trying to stop you because I don't want to hear what you have to say. At times, if we stray off the subject, we have to keep it in the confines of what we're talking about. And the other thing is is that uh, we try to keep a three-minute time frame. Sometimes we'll, we'll allow for a little more discussion at times, but uh, sometimes it's not productive to have a back and forth. So that's why I wasn't trying to be rude to you. I was just trying to keep the time frame. Um, and, and I understand that, but I was also just letting the, Miss Natasha know as well that that wasn't my intent. It was just to keep it on subject and keep us going. So next, I will move on to Terry Logston. I see your hand up. If you'd like to unmute and please uh, state your name for the record. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Terry Logston. I'm the environmental director for the Scotts Valley Band of Pomo Indians. And I have been attending the Risk Reduction Authority meetings, meetings since its inception. Um, I currently represent the tribe as one of the directors that went into effect, I don't know, less than a year ago. And so 
if you had been attending, um, you would have heard me report at different times throughout the last several years. Uh, we had funding through uh, in a CAL FIRE grant proposal that CLERC had submitted, the Clear Lake Environmental Research Center, which would have uh, funded uh, identification of bioenergy, biomass locations, and a PG&E line study for the capacity. And that was taken out because CAL FIRE um, subsequently created an entire, entire different department, a biomass utilization and workforce development division. And so our portion was taken out of that grant. We've been seeking funding to do this work for some time. Um, so it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise if anyone has attended and followed the risk reduction authority meetings. We don't have any specific locations identified yet. That's what we're hoping to do. It's more than just finding a location. There's many, many factors and it will take funding to do that. We're very excited to be a partner in this grant uh, through this whole project. It has been really heartening to hear the dedication of the partners um, and the other fellow directors talking about climate and this new climate chief climate resiliency officer and the um, opportunity that the county may have to hire an analyst to support that position and do more. And then the work that clerk would be doing uh, to implement this and track the CWPP. So um, thank you. I just thank you for considering this grant application. I think um, that it will be an amazing award for the County of Lake and all of the partners. And if we don't get it this time, we will certainly, uh, you know, get it at the next round. Thank you. Thank you. And so I see uh, Bart, you have your hand up. Um, if you could keep it brief, I will allow you to unmute and um, if you have a question or something of that nature, please let's keep it brief. As you've already as you've already spoke before, so just I understand you probably want to have a comment. So go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, the thing that I want to say is that uh, there are not at this time, as far as I know of, recordings of the meetings, and there can be, and it's something I've been trying to lobby for. I hope this meeting will uh, help that materialize into something real so that even you supervisors that can't attend the meetings can hear the recordings and simply hear for yourself what is said. Uh, in the meetings, we've had many instances of the fire chiefs of the cities saying, well, we don't quite understand what you're trying to push for. And that's taken several more meetings to explain. And I hope the risk reduction authority can can hear that, that this is, has been being requested of you, more explanation, more upfront. Uh, and I say this with the greatest respect and appreciation for what you do. All right, thank you for that. And so I don't see any other hands up uh, in the chambers or on Zoom, so I'll go ahead and close public input for this uh, time frame. I don't know, Thomas, I seen you turn your camera on. Did you have something else to say before I cl completely close it? Okay. So I'll bring it back to the board while closing public input, and we'll go from there. Did you want to say something, Supervisor? Yeah, I just want to address, you know, th the last comment about the fire. The fire chiefs all have a seat at the, at the table. Mm -hmm. uh, complete communication. Obviously, they're the ones that do the work. They're the professionals. I will never... Um, you know, say, hey, I, I know more than the fire chiefs. What we attempt to do is have open community uh, collaboration conversations about how we move forward, what's needed in the community, is this a viable opportunity? And I think we have a good line of communication. We, at almost every meeting, unless there's a fire or disaster going on at that point, we have participation uh, from our fire departments. They are there, they're committed, um, you know, and and we're working together. If you know, I, I don't I don't recall any instances like that where there's not been communication. If something comes up, we try and talk through it, work through it, and understand how we're going to move forward. Um, and like I said, some of this new stuff that's coming out, just making sure everybody has a voice is the most important thing. I think that's one thing I, I can pride the RRA on is having that open to everybody to have comment, everyone to come and attend. We meet once a month. 
Uh, you know, now we're going to add the Lake County Fire Safe Council so we can do it regional. We're having these conversations. So if there is a problem in Cobb or in Middletown or in Clear Lake or in the Oaks, we're going to start moving those things around so we can talk regionally too so we can get directly to those specific things. But, you know, I, I just have to make the comment about the participation of our fire districts. It's so important that they're there because they're the ones with the long-term vision and do this uh, that, that's what they're trained for, to help guide us in these conversations if we do get off off subject with too much government talk. <laughs> and so, uh, Ms. Grant? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if you'd allow me, uh, there is one legal clarification necessary in the resolution yes. before your board adopts it. I'd just like to point, point okay. what that yes, is. Please. That yes, oh, please. Yes, okay. please. Yeah. The, the sentence I'm referring to is the Lake County Board of Supervisors hereby appoints the county administrative officer or designee as agent to conduct all negotiations, execute and submit all documents, including but not limited to applications, agreements, and payment requests that may be necessary for competition of the aforementioned capacity building activities. Um, to be lawful, a delegation has to have specificity it can't be just wide open discretion. So perhaps, I, I'm not quite sure what you're saying, but I did appreciate Supervisor Paiska's comments that a lot of it is still in the planning stages. So this level of discretion uh, could pose a legal issue for you unless this is required by the state or the grant funder because again, the language is more than generally what the law would allow. It, this is a template from the application? From the application. Then I would suggest that if you approve the resolution that you include consensus, that this information come back to your board for at least uh, some kind of a validation or approval because it's necessary for competition of the aforementioned capacity building activities, which aren't really described in the resolution. And it gives the, the CAO the ability to do everything without ever coming back to you. And that's a discretion that is mm -hmm. unusual. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think you do have to temper it. You've done that in the past when the state or feds, um, they, they want to be able to have the speed of movement. So I understand why they want to do it, but it does pose an issue for your board uh, because it, it goes beyond what a legal delegation of authority normally encompasses. So if the grant was awarded, we would have consensus or to come well, back? Well, I think you would need to do it now do to it make now. it clear okay. so that you have a record if it can't be part of this because if all you wanted was to have the county administrative officer to have the authority to effectuate the grant program as described in the partnership agreement, mm -hmm. you could do that because the partnership agreement is part of what your board's approving today. So all of those parameters are established and the delegation of authority is specific. But to do this, which is just do anything, anywhere, anytime, anyhow, is a great deal more than that. And so I'm just raising it. The If it has to be part of this document, then again, I would suggest that at least by consensus so that it's part of the record that you make that delegation with specific uh, direction to the CAO, that all of these things come back to your board for approval. That protects the county, certainly protects the CAO, and it won't get in the way of your resolution, though I do really wish the state and feds would quit insisting on these because they put they put the board and the person who's being delegated the authority in a precarious position legally. I, I agree with making those changes that were su suggested from Anita. Yeah. Uh, to make sure that we're doing those things, we can still move uh, in the direction we would like to, uh, but we need to be very clear. Uh, I, I completely agree with those amendments. I cannot put that in a motion I will just I will agree to that I agree yeah okay supervisor Bate. so um, when I mentioned last time that there was a, a part in the agreement that says um, Lake County will provide staff for the duration of the grant and that I had some um, 
concerns of what exactly that means and what the capacity level is, this line was another one. Um, who exactly is the county administrator conducting negotiations, executing it for this new group that is being created? And are they working on the behalf of that group outside of the scope of the Board of Supervisors? Like if we have NCO, if we have clerk, if we have Scotts Valley making a request, we're saying that our CAO will jump at that request and make those things happen. I'm, I'm trying to figure out um, who's in charge of directing the CAO when the, this is a partnership and how does that work? I, I don't know. Again, the Ms. language Grant. is too vague to be able to answer those questions. I've, frankly, I've, I haven't seen one from the state or federal government that is quite this broad in, in some time. Normally, it reflects back upon an agreement or an application, and the parameters are established in that document. And the person delegated with authority, well, your board knows this. You see those delegations all the time in documents for various grant applications. The delegation goes to submitting the grant, to filing any additional certifications, amendments to the grant agreement, and any funding requirements as evidenced by the application, those kind of things, because that's a more ministerial mechanism to do this. But this is, again, this is very general, just anywhere, anytime, anyhow, and it is It, it, it's a difficult uh, burden with this verbiage. So again, I, um, if if there is if there is consensus, uh, at least uh, that the resolution would be adopted uh, with the board's understanding that none of these decisions. Uh, that the decisions by the CAO in this regard would be tentative ones which would have to come back to your board for approval. You can do that. As I said, if, if the language could be changed, it would be better to give the authority to effectuate the grant program as described in the partnership agreement for the collaborative stakeholder structure of the Climate Safe Lake Project because you've got that document here, so it establishes the parameters for you. Uh, you can do one or the other, but um, I would I would recommend that you do pick one. And then uh, Supervisor Simon, and then I'll. This, did you want to? Oh, that works. Yeah. So, Anita, obviously we want to move forward with this today in any way. I agree with this. You know, making those changes, and as we go through the application process, just like we done in the Jump Start program, these things are starting. These are issues that we see we need to work through. Um, but I absolutely in, am in support, Anita, if you can help us solidify that language that protects the county but also helps us move forward today. That's, that's what, what I would like to do because this is part of that conversation and partnership as we're moving forward. And somewhat of a pilot program is being developed for counties and other ones uh, for the future. So, uh, yeah, it, it may mean... Uh, that we aren't successful, but I think we need to establish these boundaries as we move forward uh, to do that, yeah. protect the county, and also allow us to move forward. So uh, I'm in agreement, Anita, uh, uh, if you will wordsmith the resolution and those types of things, mm -hmm. or help us. Well, as I said, if you're concerned that failing to follow the uh, template will somehow jeopardize the county, can, you're, the county can still effectuate some protection um, through consensus direction to the CAO that will temper that authority. Uh, but the, the authority needs to be constrained either by language directly in the resolution or by your direction on the record to the CAO today. And again, that's for the county's protection. Certainly it's also for the CAO's protection because acting without lawful authority is not a pretty place for an individual to be either. So. So you can do either one. I, I don't know the term, the circumstances of the grant and whether this would be precarious to consideration. So I'm offering the alternatives. Your board can do either. I don't think amending the resolution will um, jeopardize our chances. 
Okay, well then as I said, I would suggest get granting the authority to effectuate the grant program as described in the partnership agreement for the collaborative stakeholder structure for the Climate Safe Lake project. Yeah. That if works. that's fine, then I would suggest number three be rewritten to just include that language, and I can provide that in writing for the final. Okay. But your board can approve it based on the, the oral amendment, if you like. Supervisor Sabati. Uh, so a couple of things. One, I'll, I'll just kind of step back a little bit. I know in the presentation there was talking about difficulties of other regions moving forward and kind of leaving us behind and, and not really fitting within the coastal valley or, or the central valley or whatever other regions exist. Um, and I know that we've been feeling like that for a long time. And I, I, I think that it's important that we force ourselves to break through into some of those regions. Because for example, our water, our water goes everywhere outside of Lake County, whether it's through Cash Creek, Pewter Creek, or Eel River that goes into the Russian River. Uh, we have to use whatever means we have what that comes from our county to be able to connect with other regions to be able to uh, enhance and increase our voice as we're asking for uh, these types of climate change programs or grants. And I think we can make those things happen. Um, I think it's good that we don't just say, oh, well, we're not part of a region and that we are trying and, and attempting to get these things accomplished. Uh, but I hope that we continue to fight to become a part of those regions so that we have greater access to resources to be able to do the things that we need to do because there is um, common uses of our resources here in the county that we should be able to be a part of some of these regions. Uh, just I think historically we have not been and hopefully we can change those things. So I just kind of wanted to speak on that and, and I totally understand the feeling um, but I'm thinking of like the um, Potter Valley Project. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Lemsa. And, and my, our last conversation um, with uh, Supervisor Gore when we met with both the uh, Water Resources and uh, Mendocino County and Sonoma County. Climate change is a problem that we have to figure out what is a fair way to do this, not how can I grab what I need to make sure and save my community because it's going to have to be across all imaginary lines on how we solve these things. So not, it's not a negative on, on, on what's here, it's a pushing for continuing to try and strive to become a part of these greater regions so that we can have larger access to larger amounts of resources to be able to do the things that we need to do. Yeah, so I'll just, we are doing that. We are inserting ourselves, but there are pilot projects that have been developed by the state and that we can't be a part of. And, and, and the LIDAR um, project is one example. There's also these woody biomass pilot programs that the governor's OPR office has set up. And, and it wasn't until we brought it to their attention that they realized that they excluded us. And I, I've got them coming up tomorrow for a two-hour meeting tomorrow afternoon because they, they feel terrible for not including us and putting, this in, putting us in this position. So it is, we are doing that. And, and there are other coalitions that we're being added to and the work is slow, but that is happening. Okay. Um, and then I'm not gonna put words in uh, Ms. Khan's uh, mouth. I know that she got cut off. Um, I think she's still on, but uh, she mentioned something about um, specific agencies or, or something along the lines of uh, talking about that. And, and I, I want to talk about NCO real quick, um, just to get an idea of what it is that we're doing here. We, as a board, approved funding to provide uh, the RRA uh, to go after and find a lead agency. Mm -hmm. um, you guys did an RFP and you found NCO as the lead agency. So my question is, why are we giving money to NCO rather than money to just the RRA. Uh, if you're the lead agency, at that point you work as, an, as the RRA and you get reimbursed from the RRA for the work that you do. At least that's my experience in working with JPS. So I'm kind of curious, is there a separation between NCO and your RRA or as, are, they, like, are they not acting as the lead agency when they're uh, uh, singled out in this partnership? or are they singled out, but they're the lead agency of the RRA? That, uh, that to me is part, partially confusing, because we work with NCO with so many different things um, and different programs, um, and just kind of curious as to 
how that works, because I think that, that, that is another uh, concern of typically that goes through the JPA and then it goes to the um, nonprofit rather than directly to the nonprofit around the JPA. And so kind of curious how this is all supposed to work. Because it's the NCO staff. The RRA doesn't have staff, so we're engaged with NCO to provide staffing. The RRA um, isn't, so that's why. So we are, we're not hiring our own staff with the RRA. It's, if you want to say it's going to go through the RRA to NCO, I mean, that's ultimately in this agreement, the RRA is going to be um, making all of the decisions um, together as to where the funding goes. But NCO has stepped up to provide the staffing for, for this support. So that's why. Okay. Well, I, I, just, just to, since we're about to go to a vote, uh, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable uh, with the lack of a conversation at this level to be able to reach and figure out what the partnership looks like. Uh, I get it as far as Scotts Valley, they are truly a member of the uh, RRA, um, have a seat at the table. Others have been seated at the table but are not members of the RRA and have been chosen out of the other many groups of people that show up there uh, to be part of this partnership. I would have preferred an RFP to make sure we get the qualified and uh, best fit so that we can move forward. Um, and I think that also uh, with the biochar, we're looking at zero biochar, potentially up to eight. And I think that if we offered some competition of you get two, you get two, you get two, or you get four and you get four, if we did an RFP for that, that maybe we would have a greater group to work with to be able to accomplish our goals. Uh, and I just feel like I, I, I've been harping on the RFP and the uh, transparency of it all uh, and the fairness of it all, and I'm not sure that that is the case here, uh, which makes me very uncomfortable. Uh, I also don't see the application, so I don't know what exact, uh, exactly is being promised other than what summaries I've seen. Um, and I, I saying trust us is yes, but words on paper matter, uh, especially when approving contracts and agreements. Um, and and I'm, I'm uncomfortable with what is in front of us. And so I just have a couple questions, and I know they probably have been answered. Um, and so, as mentioned, NCO is being funded from the county, um, some county fund source to help with RRA. And then this grant will also provide that type of funding as well, if, if, if we get it, of course. It's, it's, there's going to be more positions okay. hired. And um, so and if the grant is not... Um, if we don't get the grant, um, then from there forward, we get to a point of just trying to re, kind of reform and then find another funding source of some nature. For all the projects? Yes. So what I mean is if this grant doesn't go through, we don't get accepted. We, yeah. we will just kind of reform and come back together. And once another one comes up, we'll come up with the same type of... Yes. Yeah, so, it just improve what we didn't, what, what, what wasn't... Uh, right. So... Yeah, if more capacity building grants come um, our way, then yeah, we'll look to expand that capacity in the RRA. Um, and if there's climate action grants that come our way, then that we'll be applying for that. And maybe it won't be um, so broad. It'll be uh, maybe parsed out in smaller grants. We'll have to see. But we've identified the needs and we know what, you know, what we need to do and we'll figure out how to get there one way or the other. And so I know um, one of the things when I, when I was on the Risk Reduction Authority, one of the biggest struggles was getting the work done. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very difficult. We didn't have, you know, we did ask staff to do some things, but it wasn't amongst the all, all of the things that we have to do in this county, regardless if it's a department, uh, administration, administration, it's always a difficult task to, you know, appropriate that type of work towards them. We know with all the different projects, when it comes to, I just kind of am dealing with this with water resources in a sense, where um, they're part of the Middle Creek Restoration Project, but they're also part of Middle Creek Flood Project, they're also part of the GSA, you know, all of these other, you know, I guess, uh, tasks that are longstanding. And um, at times we get, in, you know, as a county and uh, in general, we get put in a position where, um, 
you know, it's looked at like we, we're not trying to do anything. And it, the fact of it is, is that we're, they are trying to, and it's not just that. But um, I know um, that was a discussion yesterday that we had with uh, uh, Middle Creek was there was uh, Tomaj Anderson from, uh, he's from Robinson, working from Robinson, but he's from Scotts Valley. His comments were about uh, having a monthly meeting because they wanted to be notified, but they don't understand the burden it takes on the staff to do it. That's why we mm -hmm. had the discussion to say, hey, look, let's do a bi biannually, I found out that's the word for it, biannually every two months. Uh, meeting and then in the middle we have to make sure we conduct a uh, an update um, because it does get burdensome for the staff to conduct the information for that meeting have the video put it on YouTube have the minutes all of these other things mm -hmm. every month and so um, and so I and so I get that and I get the struggle too that um, Supervisor Sabatia you brought up about the um, ad hoc Brown Act and us not knowing specific things just like when we brought forward the or you brought forward the 800k for the cannabis funds to go into the Middle Creek project and we 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 asked the the rest of the board members to in essence we had the pres you know the presentation but at the same time we we're basically asking them to trust us as well, um, hoping, and we know that there's a plan for that as well, but I'm just, I know the frustration people ask me about uh, fire and resiliency all the time, especially when it comes to RCRC, and I have to say, look, here's their, here's their numbers, call them, they're entrenched in it, I'm not, I used to be on risk reduction, but it's changed since that time frame. Um, during that time frame, I know you were an active member uh, from the Cobbier Council, so I know that um, heavily involved with that type of stuff. And I know another comment that uh, Tamaj brought up was with the tribes, the being at the table, being at the table and having the opportunity to assist and be part of the projects rather than just kind of being brought in when, whenever it's either we need to ensure that we have this collaboration or whatever the case may be. But it's good to see that there are some tribes trying to at least carry some of the load here. And um, I think too that, uh, you know, it just, it gets it, it gets sometimes uh, burdensome, but at the same time, I know I understand the public's request and need to know more about some of the projects. But a lot of times, these are in the development stage, um, and, and it, it's almost like uh, sometimes there's a want or desire to kill the project for whatever reason. Um, I don't know if it's uh, needing a specific champion or uh, whoever's doing. I don't know what it is, but that happens quite frequently. I've noticed in the public, um, like just like the the project uh, that Scotts Valley wanted for a, a lease. I know it was discussed that they wanted to eventually do a biochar, but they still have to go through the planning process. That still may be killed uh, on on its own, if that makes sense. And I hate using the word killed, but it might not go through. That happens, um, and so I think, and I'm just assuming here, but I, I think that the eight spots that they're talking about, I would think like for me, if I'm gonna to try to do a project as such, I'm gonna try and get as many, put as many out there to try to hopefully land one or two. Um, and, and so um, I'm not sure if that's the case, but I just know in, in working on projects and ensuring that uh, we get something going, that that would happen. So um, I, I don't know, I'm just, just kind of recapping on, on everything that's been discussed. I appreciate questions, I appreciate the presentation. Um, the questions were very important because we, you know, county council gave us some insight on um, how, some, how some of the information or the uh, verbiage could be fixed so that that way we have more protection on our part. Um, and, and, and a lot of times when we're given these uh, documents from the state or federal government, they always give you like a template to go from and they know that we're going to church it up or whatever the case may be. So I'm glad we're doing that, ready to move forward. Sorry for kind of talking a lot, but I just wanted to kind of give my insight um, as to where I'm at with this. So yeah, if there's no other uh, discussion. Um, uh, someone can either offer the resolution. I think that's what it is, right? Yep. Yep. I think so, there's both a resolution. I'll the offer comment. the resolution as amended by county council. Resolution has been offered. Supervisor, Supervisor Simon, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Supervisor Sabatier. Nay. Supervisor Paiska. Yes. And Supervisor Crandall. Aye. Thank you. And then I think there's B. B is, um, I move that we designate a signatory for the partnership agreement to be um, the chair of the board. Is that what this is? Or do we, I just. It was said differently, but I think that fits. <laughs> Ms. Grant, I think you had. Uh... Okay, still moved. Second. So I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries three to one. All right, so with that, I know we have one, we have another timed item, uh, but we're gonna take a short break. Uh, I know we're gonna <laughs> take a five minute break. So 11.25, we'll come back. 
community development. I think we're going to be ready for the 6.5 item at that time. Thank you for. Been out of coffee for a while. All right, we're back from our break, and uh, we are on item 6.5. Uh, public hearing, consideration of proposed subdivision extension SDX 22-01 for Valley Oaks, location 18196 and 18426 South State Highway 29, Middletown, lots 51 and 36, APNs 0142601, 0142036. And I'll turn it over to Director Turner. Morning, Director Turner for Community Development. I will hand over the presentation to our planner, Eric Porter. Thank you. Good morning, um, Supervisors. Um, we're here today to look, debate about um, debate. whether to grant a one-year extension to Valley Oaks. Sorry, I'm having a technical challenge here. Um, next slide, please. So the project address and APN numbers were mentioned. Um, owner is Valley Oaks Land and Development. The subdivision's got a very uh, long history to it. I won't go into the history of it here unless um, there's a request for a background on it. I do have the background here. Um, I think it's in the Planning Commission staff report. Um, property is 150 acres. Uh, it's split zone, PDC, PDR are the primary zones. There is some open space that's on a small portion of it primarily to separate uh, the different portions of it. Next slide, please. So the applicants requested a one-year extension. Uh, that would extend it through until July, I'm sorry, January 25th of 2023. So essentially they're gonna have to come back in and apply for a longer extension. I think in the motion I indicated October 4th only because it's today and I thought they could extend uh, one year from the date of the extension, but the director reminded me that no, it's one year from the date of um, the original approval, which is January 25th of uh, 2018. So they've requested the one year extension. Um, they've already been approved for two years of extensions. This would be year number three. Um, Chapter 17 of our county code allows for up to three years of extensions. However, the Subdivision Map Act allows for up to six years of extensions. So we have a kind of a conflict between the Subdivision Map Act, which we regard as being the overriding rule for subdivisions. Um, took this to the Planning Commission on August 25th. They unanimously recommended the extension. Um, the applicants have applied for a three parcel partition, which is not on the table today. In fact, that probably won't be brought to the uh, board unless it's appealed. The way the code's set up, uh, the Planning Commission actually has the ability to uh, approve the parcel maps. Uh, they've also applied for a modification, which again is uh, under review internally. And the reason for the modification is because they needed to have an alternative uh, route into the development. Um, there's a problem with a leg connecting the commercial part of the development with the new roundabout. And it's currently um, under litigation between Caltrans and the applicant. The modification itself would simply add another tax slot on as a secondary access. Um, whether the modification is approved later, uh, they would still have to go through a major use permit for any development on any of the commercial lots, the way the, uh, the original general plan of development and specific plan of development were set up. So getting back to the uh, subdivision itself, could I have the next slide please? Uh, that's a picture of the subdivision map that was approved in 2018. Next slide, please. Um, we do not show uh, the lot that is going to be under consideration with the modification on it because that would not be part of the approval today. It would be limited to two tax lots and that would be APNs 51 and 38. Next slide, please. Um, the history of the subdivision is extensive. I didn't go into a whole lot of detail in this report um, other than to say when the original subdivision approval date was. 
they received a two-year extension on May 26 by the Board of Supervisors, May 26, 2020. Um, they applied for this extension on April, 20, April 1st, 2022, um, prior to this expiration of the subdivision. And that the California MAB Act allows for extensions of up to six years. If a one-year extension is approved, that would take up three of the six years of potential extensions for this applicant. Next slide, please. Uh, so we had to evaluate it for general plan conformance, Middletown area plan conformance, zoning ordinance conformance, county code chapter 17, subdivision conformance, and finally the subdivision map act. Next slide, please. So in chapter 17 of the county code, it talks about subdivisions on a final map, and that's where the three-year time duration is found. Um, at the bottom of this, I indicate that the California Subdivision Map Act allows for up to six years of extensions. So the recommendation is for um, the board to approve the subdivision extension SDX 22-01 for a period of one year and the continuation or the extension date would terminate January 25th, 2023 rather than October 4th, 2023. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Supervisor Spati? I was going to wait for Supervisor Simon. Just one question in, in the line there. It says, with conditions for a period of one year. Uh, can you elaborate on conditions? Or is that just something that was put in there? It just reestablishes the date of the approval. Okay. Because ordinarily, there aren't a whole lot of conditions that could be tied to the subdivision. Um, other, all other existing subdivisions. Okay, okay, I just, just for clarification on that one, to say with conditions, I just wanted to make sure that I did ask that question. Thank you very much. I just wanted to clarify that because it said with conditions. So um, obviously, uh, this being a District 1 project, we know, and you're right, we don't want to go in the history, but it's a long-standing project as we're moving forward. Um, obviously, I'm in support. Uh, you know, of, of extending it for one more year. There's work to be done, obviously, from their end. Uh, but if we can allow to do that housing uh, moving forward is something that this county is desperately in need of and opportunities. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to get this project completed. Uh, you know, some of the stuff was talked about, the leg off of the roundabout, some other, you know, conversations I think that need to happen. But um, ultimately, this is something that we need to be moving towards. Um, so obviously in favor today, and thank you for bringing this um, for approval. All right. Let's see what it's Yeah, uh, two questions. Um, number one, did, did, was there a change in amendment to the water source? Because I thought the original water source was groundwater, uh, and now it says um, that it's Hidden Valley water. I'm not aware of any change to it. Um, my understanding was the groundwater source is Hidden Valley Lake uh, Water District. So uh, we'll need to confirm that most certainly when the uh, parcel map goes before the Planning Commission and when the uh, modification moves further forward. Um, my understanding, Supervisor, is that it's uh, Hidden Valley Lake Water District. Okay, because I thought originally when we approved it, there was a, still a moratorium, so it wasn't eligible for, uh, and I, I could be wrong. I just looked at it, and I was surprised to see that on there, because I thought that that wasn't the case when we first looked at it, in tw or when I first looked at it in 2020. Well, sure, verify that. Yeah, it's going to be critical for uh, any future development. Yeah. And then my second question, I'll just pass on. All right. Not seeing any other comments. I'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions on this uh, item. Uh, Do we have anybody on Zoom? Oh, on Zoom? yeah. Let me let me go on here. I wonder if Fletcher's on here. Uh, <laughs> Richard Tucker. Uh, Rich, uh, so Richard Tucker, if you could come off of uh, mute, and we'll go ahead and uh, let you uh, comment. Well, good morning. Can you all hear me now? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you to the uh, board and chair for uh, receiving comments. I'm Rick Tooker. I'm a land use planner for Keith Gapison and the partnership 
that is owner and applicant to Valley Oaks. Uh, one, we wanted to at least just say we're here with these hybrid meetings. It's impossible to know who's in the audience. And we are here in the audience uh, participating in the process and actively engaged with uh, county staff. I think with response to the uh, question about water, yes, the district is the uh, provider of water for this project. We have a will serve uh, as well. So I just want to clarify that. I uh, also uh, thank you for uh, mentioning to Eric in particular, the other applications that uh, we hope to have determined complete uh, soon. It's, there's some work on our part to get there, but those will be before the planning commission and the board uh, like I say, hopefully soon. Lastly, I'd like to end on this. It's unfortunate that we're learning just today that the uh, deadline for the expiration is January. The conversations that we've had, at least so far, it was our understanding that it would be in May, uh, which was the one year extension uh, date or deadline, if you will, to the last extension. It simply means that we have to immediately refile for another extension, which is unfortunate, like I say. Uh, the work that we need to do will take more than October, November, December to complete. So, you know, please don't be surprised for that filing. But uh, we, like I say, understood this to be a one year extension uh, through to the date that it was approved the last time. October would have been terrific, but uh, we understand why that hasn't occurred. So, if you have any questions of us, uh, we're glad to answer them. Otherwise, we hope to see you soon on our other applications that are in process. Thank you, sir. And so I see uh, Bet Betsy Kahn, if you'd like to unmute, and uh, we'll go from there. It pleases the board. I uh, just cleared it with county council that you do have the ability to extend it to the May date. Okay. Which would help the applicant so they don't have to come to the office tomorrow to apply for another one. All right, thank you for that input. And uh, okay, Betsy, if you'd like to uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, this is a kind of a uh, just a spontaneous thought here, but um, I think what what the moratorium on the water service may have had to do with the previous hexavalent chromium prohibition, which was dropped by the state Department of Public Health. Um, the, at one time, the Hidden Valley Lake subdivision uh, water system was restricted by that um, particular constituent, but that the rules were changed. So that may have a bearing on their ability to get water, but sh sure, you know, this is, that was in effect a, a few years ago, so. Okay, thank you for that. So I will just follow up on that. You know, uh, there, there was a moratorium when the drought came in 2017. Uh, there was a moratorium put on new hookups and other things in, in, in Hidden Valley. We worked. I brought something here to the board with Community Service District and worked with those guys. So the moratorium on that one was lifted. That may have uh, been one. But I know there's been so many iterations of this project uh, with the um, the commercial development that was happening and other things. So... Um, but I do know that this board uh, supported uh, the community service district and that was lifted. So that may have opened up some other things. And I've attended at least three different meetings uh, with the developers through time over this project in the uh, Hidden Valley Community Service District. So yeah, a lot going on, uh, but we're small steps forward. But forward. But forward, yeah. <laughs> Is there any other public comments on this item? And Betsy, I still see your hand up. Did you want to comment? Did you still want to finish your comment or? No, sir, thank you. Okay. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close public input. Uh, just like to say this is, I, I was a part of the planning commission and you know, I don't know, it was not the initial stages because from what I understand, it was a long time before that it was brought forward. But I, you know, I think this, uh, this uh, subdivision has, uh, had a, so much discussion, I don't want to belabor it anymore. So go ahead, Supervisor Sabati. I, I do have a question. I was wondering if Ms. Grant can, because um, you said you can extend it till May. Is, is that the extent of the potential of extensions? And also, can you explain uh, how that's possible if our code says no more than three years? Well, it says no more than three years. And I had understood that community development said this would be the third year. And my comment was based upon just when does that one-year extension start? And here there's been a delay of several months. 
So it just seemed that it would be fair to allow for the extension to go to May. But your board can certainly decide otherwise and go from the life of the project. The ordinance right now says three years for extensions. And while the Subdivision Map Act uh, does provide for six, it um, says up to. And so I don't know that there's actually a conflict. There are extensions allowed. It, had the county not allowed for extensions, that would be in conflict with the act. But I don't know that this would be in conflict. So your board's kind of uh, hamstrung by the existing local ordinance now. And one more question for you. Um, I, I want to support this. I want to see this happening. I think housing is absolutely critical for us. Uh, the fact that there's a gap between the previous extension and the new extension doesn't create a problem. Because if it's from May to May, then somewhere between January 25th of 2022 and May of 2022, there's a gap now that will exist. I just want to make sure that that doesn't come back to bite the applicant or the developer. Well, actually, your board might want to take a five-minute break and let me talk to the department to see if that's going to pose an issue. Okay. Okay. So with that, we'll take a five-minute break and come back at 11.50. All right. Welcome back from the break. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and continue where we left off, and uh, I'll give the floor back to uh, Director Turner. Thank you. We appreciate the time to be able to confer with County Council. Um, one of the issues we took into consideration is the time that it takes from application to actually coming before the board for approval which can be significant. So uh, we ended up with a solution that the board can waive the three-year limit that's currently existing in our code exi and extend the parcel uh, or extend the subdivision map to January 25th, 2024. That will keep the original application date uh, intact uh, or the original approval date intact, but allow an amount of time that is substantive or helpful to the applicant. Ms. Green? Yes, I think that uh, given the, the delay that to have this come for a one-year extension in October for an extension to January, there is an intrinsic unfairness in, in that system. And that means that uh, three-quarters of the year was eaten up just in processing. So. I, I do agree with this. The local law, the, your local ordinance is the one with the three years, and your board can determine not to apply it in this case because of the delay in bringing this to you. You're still going to be well within the comfort level of state law requirements, so it is an accommodation. You need not make it, but you, I, I believe you could make it if you make a finding that the extraordinary delay justifies waiving the local law requirements of up to three Any other comments from the board? No. I'm in favor of being able to move forward. I think I've made my comment there, so. All right. The fact that it's, the fact that it's now a later date and we can find and, and uh, have the findings to be able to provide that, I think, is absolutely useful. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor. I am as well. So, um, yeah. We are looking for public comment? Yep. Uh, at, the t at the time you make your motion, I would suggest you include the findings, the, the, the extraordinary delay in bringing this to your board. All right, I'm going to do the best that I can here then. I would like to um, move to, uh, let me pause. Uh, Supervisor Simon, if I could. This will be an extension to, I believe it was January 25 of 2024, is that correct? Uh, based upon the extraordinary delay in bringing the extension request to your board. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Opposed? And motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kim. And so with that, uh, looks like we are at our non-timed items. However, we are at 11.53, and I want to see how the board feels about either moving forward or stopping here and taking a lunch break. Let's just go. Let's okay. do these. If we're ready to move forward, we'll move forward. So non-timed items number one, 
or 7.2 is consideration of the following advisory board appointments, Lower Lake Waterworks District 1 Board of Directors. And so with that, um, let's see, there's one vacancy and three folks on this. And so, um, am I right? I think it says yeah. that, yeah. So. Um, yeah, I'm prepared. Uh, we've got to open it up for public comment. Yeah, I'll open it up. Is there any other comments? No. So I'll open it up for public comments. Is there anybody in the public that would like to uh, comment on this item? And if we can get the uh, the uh, map, map down if possible. I'm not seeing any hands up, so I'll go ahead and bring it back to the board for action. I have a question for Supervisor Simon. Go ahead. Um, so we, we received a um, e-comment. Uh, From Mr. Raffanelli? Yeah, just kind of curious. It, the members of the Lower Lake Water District have to be within the Lower Lake or not? I wasn't quite sure where to find that information. But they have to be within the, within the district. Okay. Uh, at least that's the way all the boards, I know that the uh, Kaliomi Water District, they have to be within the district and receiving some type of service. Okay. So I did see the comment, uh, but prepared to move forward today. All right. And so with that, um, I am prepared to move forward with uh, with the appointment of Gene Yanich uh, to the Lower Lake Water Community Water District. Second. So I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed and motion carries. Excellent. All right. So next uh, we have our 7.3 sitting as the Lake County Watershed Protection District Board of Directors. A waive the formal bidding process pursuant to Lake County Code Section 38.2 as it is not in the public interest due to the unique nature of goods or services. And B authorize Chair of Board of Directors of Lake County Watershed Protection District to sign and enter into agreement with Peterson Brewstad Incorporated for engineering design services for the Clover Creek Bypass Gravel Removal Project for an amount of $44,820 and authorize the chair to sign. And we will go ahead and give the floor to Director Scott DeLeon of Water Resources. Good morning, board. Scott DeLeon, Public Works and Water Resources Director. Um, today's item is uh, for a contract with a consultant to prepare preliminary plans uh, for a project uh, that uh, involves not only the Clover Creek bypass, but all of uh, the Clover Creek and Alley Creek uh, facility uh, in Upper Lake. Uh, these, uh, these creeks were uh, levied uh, by the Corps of Engineers back in the 50s. Uh, we've had significant gravel buildup within the channels. Uh, and um, one of the projects uh, that's been identified uh, involves the removal of that gravel. Uh, we need to have some preliminary plans in order to develop a project scope how many yards of material need to come out, uh, and also to be able to start some preliminary environmental work that is all key to uh, making applications for funding. It's going to be a very expensive project, uh, so we need as much information as we can. Uh, we are proposing to use Peterson Brustad Incorporated. Uh, they are the engineering firm that is currently performing the feasibility study of, uh, of that entire uh, Creek region. Uh, they've been doing an analysis of uh, our levees, uh, how, they, uh, how they, they've been doing the modeling, how the levees perform under certain storm events and, and certain conditions. And um, they have all of the uh, topographic information of the existing channels. They've been performing the modeling. Uh, and uh, we felt that um, uh, because of the unique nature of the project, uh, that it involves uh, you know, unique information, information that they have uh, developed as part of their other project that they're working with us. Uh, we felt that um, it was, uh, w would, would be um, uh, unique and uh, not in the county's best interest to uh, competitively bid this. Additionally, um, there are, uh, potential funding sources that are available. NRCS is one, uh, uh, hazard mitigation or, or is another. Uh, and the sooner that we can get some plans done and, and get a project description prepared, uh, the sooner that we can start chasing uh, uh, 
uh, grant funds uh, to try to do the project. Uh, we also believe that it's going to require a pretty significant environmental review. And again, the sooner we can get this done, uh, the sooner we can get started on that. And, and uh, the development of RFP and all that type of uh, work takes a lot of time. Uh, and so we felt uh, that this would be uh, an appropriate use of an exemption from competitive bidding. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Go ahead, uh, Supervisor Spati. Uh, so, so I'll say that I, I don't necessarily agree that it's a unique service. I think that this is almost like a, an amendment to the contract that you have already where you're extending the scope of service. This is not doing the actual work. They're not removing the gravel. They're continuing based off their studies. Um, I think that there is, I mean, maybe there's not a physical emergency currently with the situation. Uh, but there's definitely uh, the potential for it if we get large amounts of rains. Uh, and so I think that there's enough here to be able to move forward. I just wanted to at least make my statement since I get picky about the RFP process. Um, so yeah. But uh, I, I want to add, because I don't know that you said this, you did do an RFP process in the original feasibility study in order to obtain this group. and. I'm assuming you will be doing an RFP process for those who actually will be removing the gravel and doing the actual project when it comes down to it. Absolutely, and thank you. It is mentioned in the memorandum, but I did not mention it in my brief summary. Uh, Peterson Brustad was selected through the competitive process following the county's consultant selection uh, policies. So uh, yes, they, they were uh, chosen with that process. And absolutely, uh, should we move to the point where we were putting a project out to bid, that would be a construction project that would be competitively bid. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Ms. Grant? Uh, thank you. I think that, um, I think Supervisor Sabati is correct with regard to an exemption from from competitive bidding, I did meet with the deputy director last week, and it's it's not really a uh, unique uh, good or service. I had suggested then that the the applicable exemption would be producing no economic benefit to the county for the reasons mentioned, and your board can certainly find the basis for a waiver different than the one recommended. Um, the service itself is not unique. The circumstances, however, apparently are, and if your board finds that to be the case, then you can find that because of the unique circumstances, it would be repetitive for someone else to come in and thereby no economic benefit. The, the one other point I'd like to suggest is the second recital, whereas the consultant shall work at the direction of district staff, et cetera, the consultant's an independent contractor so they don't actually work at the direction of staff. That's what an employee does. Um, the, the function, the work that the consultant's doing is described in Exhibit A. So I'd suggest you might just want to delete that second recital to avoid any confusion between independent contractor and employee. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Just real quick, and, and I think I'm somewhat paraphrasing, but I know here it says design plans adequate to develop quantity takeoffs for the gravel. Uh, that's still within the scope of service of what's being requested, so taking this off does not take away that duty that we're expecting them to no. complete. Okay. It's also just a recital, so it doesn't actually impose the duty. That's in the yeah. consultant. All right. Hearing no other comments, I'll open it up to the public for any comments. I don't see anyone in the chambers coming up to the microphone. I'm looking on Zoom right now. All right. Not seeing any comments or hands up. I'll go ahead and bring it back to the board for action. It's in my district, however. Uh, uh, well, no, it's not necessarily. Yeah, it is. It is. Sorry. It's a contract, but it's for the area. So go, anybody go ahead and make the mortgage motion for me. So can I just make one comment before it goes? Um, I know it's specific to this item, but, you know, Appreciate the work being brought forward with this. Obviously, removal of gravel throughout all of our creeks really needs to be looked at. It's it's somewhat of the situation we've gone into forest management. No burning, no clearing of trees, none of those things, and it's piling up. 
It's affecting all of our communities in the South County uh, with Pewter Creek and also the creek that runs behind Middletown there, Salina Creek. Uh, you know, over the years since, you know, um, Epidemio, the gravel plant quit there. They used to take all the gravel out from the dam, from the creek down. It's just it's just building up. So appreciate seeing this coming uh, to the board for the area. We know the the what's going on up in the north side, but it's also affecting all of our creeks. And you know, I think when we're looking at this climate action, those types of things, all these conversations we're having, vegetation abatement, they all come together. So I'm glad to see this coming to the board. Obviously, I'm in favor of it, uh, but countywide. Is something I know you guys are thinking about, but just glad to see this 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 thing happening as we move forward because it is something uh, that that affects all of us. As you said, our, a lot of our water comes in and goes out, but there's communities that are being affected. Hidden Valley being one of those that is flooded every time it gets over a certain gallon per minute at the at the dam. There's a section in Hidden Valley that floods on the backside, so there are challenges. And if we can get some of this stuff cleaned out, it's going to help down the road not the permanent solution always there's many different things come into play with that but getting some of this gravel out of our creeks is very important you know I'll just add something as well you know um, last week we had a workshop and I want to say director de Leon you did a great job answering questions I know that this was a big subject there um, and you know I'm glad you brought up the the sediment and, and all sorts of situations and how a group used to have the opportunity to take out the sediment and I know some of the folks that were talking in this meeting were talking about the fact that some of the sediment was take handshake deals you know they were done before and you know it'd be wonderful if we can do that again but at the same time uh, some of the laws were put into place and uh, so we're you know, doing our best to navigate uh, around that and do what we can in order to get this project moving um, it's uh, it's provided uh, a bit of contention but I know that uh, director de Leon has been working on it and I know that the uh, um, the, the initial uh, meeting that they had in December went forward. Uh, I think the initial contract was passed in February and uh, pretty confident it might have uh, got a little sooner, but we're here where we're at now. So uh, again, Director DeLeon, thank you for, uh, for championing this, uh, getting us to this point, and hopefully we can get to the next point with some other funding sources uh, because uh, this is very needed. So, it, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, if I could offer before anyone makes a motion, um, uh, modification to our recommended action um, would be waive the formal bidding process pursuant to Lake County Code Section 38.2 as it is not in the public interest due to the, ter the determination that competitive bidding would produce no economic benefit and B, the Lake County Watershed Protection District and then that would remain the same. Excellent. But we would modify uh, the justification under 38.2 to read that the de determination that competitive bidding would produce no economic benefit. All right. Supervisor Spati. I want to continue with uh, what Supervisor Simon started because it's correct. It's, it's, this is localized, but there's an, a, a larger issue. If and when this is done, uh, is this something that can be reused over the years for a certain number of years? I know that's what I'm working on every time I try to do fire mitigation. If we can do one control burn, how many years can we continue to do control burn so we don't have to start the whole CEQA process over and over again? Uh, is that the same here, that once something has been approved, that maybe there's a certain timeline that gravel can be removed without having to start from scratch? So that's a really complicated question. Um, it's possible. Uh, I don't know about CEQA being reused because I, I think that for every project you're going to have to go through that or we're going to have to go through that. Uh, but the plan may be able to be reused. Uh, one of the things that the consultant has discussed as part of their feasibility study is the addition of structures or areas where gravel uh, would occur accumulate uh, as opposed to it uh, falling out and disrupting the channel, creating basins that the gravel would intentionally uh, be created for the gravel to fall out. That could then be maintained. So uh, there, there are a, a number of design, uh, design options that could be put into play here where it could be reused and and the, uh, a project uh, that 
would be a routine maintenance project could be could be done. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Hearing no other comments, uh, looks like we're ready for action. I'll give it a shot, yeah. uh, Mr. Chair. I, um, as sitting as the Lake County Watershed Protection District, I move to waive the formal bidding. Uh, pursuant to Lake County Code Section 38.2, as it is not in the public interest due to the unique circumstances of the project um, and the, well, the, not, not, not the unique nature of the goods or services, but the unique circumstances um, uh, creating a lack of economic uh, incentive or economic benefit, thank you, um, and B, authorize the chair of the board of directors of the Lake County Watershed Protection District to sign and enter into agreement with Peterson Brustad Inc. for engineering design services for the Clover Creek Bypass Gravel Removal Project for an amount of $44,820 and authorize the chair to sign. I think I was close. Oh, that's fine. You're leading in that second recital and focus Second. All right, so I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Opposed? And motion carries. Thank you very much, oh, Scott. Oh, I'm so uh, sorry. The second recital of removing the, uh, the staff thing. I amend my motion to negate the recital about staff directing the contractor. Uh, I forgot about that. Did we already that. take a vote on it, though? Yeah, so. Have to reopen the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, re reopen. Okay. I apologize for that part. I misunderstood when you said leaving the recital. Uh, I move to reopen this item. All right. Second. So I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And motion carries. I got to do this again. Um, <laughs> Move to waive the formal bidding process uh, as it is not in the public interest due to a lack of economic benefit. Uh, authorize the chair of the board of directors in the Lake County Watershed Protection District to sign and enter an agreement with Peterson Brustad Inc. for engineering design services for the Clover Creek Bypass Gravel Removal Project for an amount of $44,820 and authorize the chair to sign with amendment to the agreement removing the recital as suggested. All right. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we uh, have that. It looks like we're... 5.7 was uh, removed by Director Metcalf uh, for a future... Future date. Future date. Yeah. So with that, I think it's calendars. Mm -hmm. Calendars. And uh, let's see. You want to start, Supervisor Sabatier? Sure. Yes. I uh, just want to state that I had another really good meeting uh, with SafeRx. Um, things are moving along to, again, review how we move away from just focusing on healthcare and prescription type of changes to a more uh, how are we dealing with substance abuse as a whole uh, and our overdose death rates. And so really appreciative of those that are coming together. Um, and I'm not going to get her last name right, but Kim from Public Health has been absolutely amazing. Thank you, uh, Tangerman, thank you very much. Kim Tangerman has been absolutely amazing. I uh, really appreciate her expertise and her ability to navigate through that, as well as Hope Rising as a whole uh, has been absolutely critical for that discussion, too. Um, let's see. I have a, a COC meeting coming up on Thursday, and if possible, I know RCRC is doing their little uh, legislative fire drill. Uh, as well. Hopefully I'll, I'll be able to get there. Um, I am going to the judge's breakfast in the morning and I didn't mention it this morning, but uh, Judge Freeborn started the judge's breakfast, yeah. hence why it's called the judge's breakfast. That's what I was ask. And it's been going for 27 years. And that is uh, something that uh, Dr. Mark Cooper has now taken the helm of that group and is continuing uh, to move that forward, and I don't expect it to go anywhere other than continuing in the future as well. So his legacy continues through that, uh, amongst many other things. Uh, on Friday, I am doing walnuts at the Ag Venture, even though I think I saw vineyards on there as well on the agenda. <laughs> so I think it'll be a mixture of things. But that's been interesting, uh, a good learning session, uh, and just a I'll always get to learn a little bit more intimately about our local area, uh, especially agriculture. Um, let's see. The following week, we do not meet on um, 
Tuesday, but I do have a uh, pegboard meeting on uh, that evening, and I am meeting with the Farm Bureau also. I uh, need to check in and make sure that uh, the 10th is still an okay date for them to meet with me. Um, Lake APC was canceled on the following Wednesday, um, but I still have uh, no first five. That's not happening. Uh, on the 13th, the Woodland Community College is celebrating their 50th anniversary. Uh, obviously started out as Yuba Community College rather than Woodland, came to be Woodland in 2016, I think it was. Um, absolutely a gem of the community. Um, we, we need to have access to higher education and Woodland Community College is making it happen. Was invited to speak there, so excited to have that. It should be almost a full day between a Woodland Community College board meeting or a Yuba Community College District board meeting as well as the festivities later on. Uh, and then have housing navigation on that Friday, uh, coming back on the 17th, preparing for our meeting, and back here on the 18th. And in between, uh, still continuing to work on that database. Uh, appreciate the help of Kathy Licados over in our IT department. Um, Director French has been uh, kind enough to have her help me. That's it. All right. Supervisor Simon. Finish up the board meeting today. Uh, the APC meeting was supposed to be yesterday, right? It was can or tomorrow. Oh, is that tomorrow? I thought For some it was, reason I have it on my. But account. it was canceled. It was canceled. Yeah. Yeah, it was canceled. So, um, it, uh, I do see uh, Jessica. I'm do everything I can to attend the uh, regional biomass development meeting. That's going to be in conference room B, and then later that night at 6 p.m. Uh, we have the 2022 draft CWPP public workshop uh, outreach and program here. I know we've already had the government organization one. Now this is the community one as we move forward. So excited to have that done because something you've been working on since I came on the board. Hey, we need to play. Hey, we have the CWPP. It needs to be updated. So glad to be where we are now. And hopefully these workshops can help us move through and get these things approved. Well, it will. We need to get this done. Okay. And uh, we're going to. I hate to use the, the words earlier of a, a constituent, but this one, we've got to push through. We've got to get it completed because it is the roadmap for our success here uh, for, for, for everyone in the county. So I will continue that on on um, Friday Have uh, and get back to it. Now I can see a old meeting. I've been missing a couple of those, so I will. Let's continue that on Friday and, and the weekly planning meeting. Um, be traveling this weekend uh, for the high school football program and then obviously on Monday celebrating uh, Indigenous Peoples Day um, no meeting next week I know that um, one of the organizations I really enjoyed too attending in my district we have advisory committees but we also have the Lower Lake Action Committee group and you know hopefully they're gonna get back to meetings here sooner than later I know they're they're attempting to get that done and hopefully by the end of the year we will and those are uh, usually on the second Wednesday and then Thursday night I have math also have the um, looks like there's the rural county uh, ESJPA um, usually Lars attends that I may try and chime out on that for a few minutes uh, and then on the 14th uh, have the meeting again with the CEO on the 15th there is uh, something I've been asked to attend at Robinson right is that the elders yep, the elders, um, the elders uh, and, and that is put on by uh, I think it's uh, I think it's Robinson Rancheria Robinson Rancheria yeah. so I'll be attending that obviously uh, as we move forward with that and then on Monday the 17th uh, the Lake County Risk Reduction Authority and I do just want to talk just the collaboration efforts with the Risk Reduction Authority. I know we approved some stuff today, but there's there's just so much work going on. Um, and once again, we are not out of fire season. It is all year long. But the collaboration, the pre-positioning um, of teams this year, uh, the North Shore Fire Crew, all of that work that's being done um, around the county by all the different organizations, the Firewise communities, um, the county, everything is happening, uh, even going to be more productive next year. I know there's some equipment also that is coming to town. I know there's some more masticating equipment. Uh, South Lake County Fire Protection District just, 
just got and is going to do some training. I know we were successful with the uh, evacuation corridor uh, grant uh, where we added some equipment in there for the county uh, to get some new pieces of equipment. So I think we're moving in the right direction. And the conversation for um, control burns and cultural burns is continuing to to move forward. So I think with all these tools, uh, we're, we're moving in the right direction. But Supervisor Sabati said it, and some other folks said it, there are so many other things, disasters, uh, earthquakes, flood, fire, all these other things coming together, we just need to continue what to be time? building on. What time? What time is what? The October 17th RRA. 3 p.m. The meeting is 3 p.m. at every every month uh, that we have that. Are you, are you going to get together before you, you sign in the grant? No. No. Okay. No. Uh, yep. It's Zoom. Zoom. Same thing every month. All right. Uh, with that, um, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Supervisor Simon. The Vice Chair Paiska. I did the Canoctite Challenge on Saturday with my daughter. We did 20 miles, and it's just, it's such an amazing event. It was the final ride. Um, so, a little emotional about that. But um, I'm glad I got to do that with her. Um, it was something that I had planned to do with my mom years ago, and then she got cancer and passed away. So it was like a really emotional moment for us to be able to do that together. So I'm really grateful for the team that's been doing it for the past 30 years and um, bringing all the people into our county. It was so fun. That was one of the things my daughter loved most was chatting with all the people and hearing about where they came from. Um, so anyway, big thanks for that event and um, thank you for the memories. Even though this was my first and only ride, um, I do have so many memories of the race, race coming over Cobb and being out there and cheering on riders. So um, tomorrow, busy day with TID in the morning and then I'm meeting with the constituent here with um, staff members and then the regional biomass development meeting, which is um, members from the governor's um, OPR office and um, the North Coast Regional Collaborative, which we're not a part of, um, and Debbie Franco, who was really um, interested. That's what's so fascinating is that, you know, we kind of have been left out of all these collaboratives. But they're very interested in what we've been done, what we've been doing, because we are further along than the pilot programs the state has developed and heavily invested in. And so they want to know how we've been so successful with what we've been doing, um, and then also see if they can develop uh, maybe a pilot program. Oh, that's what we're asking for: is a pilot program of our own here, since we've been left out of specifically the the coast and the valley regions. So that's, um, we had a call with them in August, we meant to just ask them some questions and then it turned into a big um, conversation about how we've been so successful. So really looking forward to that, um, that uh, we kind of tried to set that up months ago and so we've got it finally on the calendar. Then the CWPP workshop that evening, bringing that home. <laughs> Um, and then Thursday, Friday, I've got, oh yes, so I have my weekly tree meetings, but I'm also doing a CSAC training, so I've got three things happening at once on Friday, so we'll see how that works out, um, but I won't be able to, I, th I think I let Scott know that I won't be able to make that, the staff meeting. Um... And now that this grant is being turned in, I have quite a few openings on my calendar. So next Tuesday, um, you know, still trying to put together our county response to our tree mortality. There's been some delays with um, the mosquito fire, so we're reaching out and having another meeting with um, Fresno County OES director and CAL FIRE. Um, chief from that region who I met um, during uh, another OES meeting here. Um, try and put together more, you know, try and learn more again, learn more from um, people who have already done it. 
but I will say I reached, I got an email from um, Supervisor Haschek from Mendocino, and they are about to pass their um, tree mortality resolution, hopefully uh, at the next meeting, on the 18th. Napa passed theirs about three weeks ago. And um, so it's just, you know, as we look at collaboratives outside of our county and taking a regional approach, um, everything is kind of coming together with what we need to do. And, um, and then it's, that's gonna make it a lot easier to elevate our asks at the state level. So I'm, I'm happy to hear um, that there's um, forward motion with those counties and supporting them in every way that we can. And um, been, anyway, that's been really, has been really rewarding to be a part of that group. Then in the evening, there's a CWA mixer. The 13th, I have the Fire Safe Council. And then I have a meeting with constituents in Kelseyville. And then the 14th, um, weekly home hardening meeting and um, staff, weekly staff tree meeting. The home hardening, there was some delays with the FEMA funding. Uh, we were hoping to be swinging hammers in August, but the um, FEMA has pushed the deadline back to probably January, February. But what that's done is given NCO time to um, really build out their team and um, do a lot of the work that other counties have been learning about, because there was two other counties in this um, pilot program. We've caught up to them. We, we were a few months behind them. We were the third county selected, so we've caught up to them. Um, there's just been so much learning that's been happening. But this, this extra time is giving us the opportunity to have the contractors in place and, and all the agreements in place so that as soon as that funding is awarded in February, hammers can start swinging. So it's, that's really exciting. That team is just amazing. All those local people that NCO has put together, um, it's, it's phenomenal and it's really exciting. So that, um, so that's on the 14th. The 15th is um, Saturday, Heroes for Health and Safety Fair. That is always a great event. I hope everyone can come. Um, you know, Sutter puts that on, but we have lots of presentations with all of our partners. And last year, I know um, the sheriff um, deputies were there with their vehicles, giving tours to the kids. There was um, fire, fire extinguisher demonstrations. There's just so many things happening at that event. So I, I encourage everybody to get there. And then the wave of light, which is what we talked about earlier for um, pregnancy and infant losses at six o'clock that evening in Library Park. And then the 17th is my meeting with CAO Parker, CMAP meeting, RRA, and the community visioning forum meeting I'm not gonna go to. So I'll get out of that one right now. So that is, um, that's everything I've got in the next two weeks. All right. Uh, I, earlier you heard me refer to um, the workshop in Upper Lake last week and so uh, um, if you go to YouTube you can find that uh, also it's on my Facebook uh, supervisor Facebook page my public page um, I posted uh, basically uh, who was attended who was there um, and let the video speak for itself and so um, as discussed with uh, director de Leon um, there were many folks in attendance that live amongst that area in zone 8 and uh, we're really concerned with how long the project's taken and how, um, how um, where their tax funding is going when it comes to the Zone 8 uh, amount. Um, why we can't just get in there and take the sediment out. The vegetation is really high. There's a couple of folks that live right next to it. Every year, anytime there's a uh, atmospheric river, uh, folks will, I mean, it, it starts like it, I remember last uh, year in November, there was a rain that took place, like I want to say started at like 6 a.m. By the time it was 5 p.m., it was like almost touching the bridge. And so uh, the vegetation is what uh, heavily influences what happens there. And so um, 
it, it, this has been something that a lot of folks have been talking about, especially in the Middle Creek area where Clover Creek is as well. So um, having that dialogue, um, it was, it was uh, great to have uh, uh, super, uh, ex-supervisors or supervisors emeritus, I call them. Uh, Rob Brown and uh, Gary Lewis were there and they gave us some historical insight as to what took place. Um, it, there was a lot of uh, really uh, informed uh, people that attended as well, uh, citizens that were getting their questions answered and it started out a little shaky but we got, we got it moving and we got it going and uh, overall success and I think that um, with, with what took place today I think we can get in that direction um, not just for um, to attain that goal but also for other opportunities for funding. Um, if we can get the plan, feasibility, all of those things forward like there's different agencies, like like mentioned, in NRCS, uh, whatever has hazard mitigation, and then like even the Blue Ribbon Committee, that might be another option. But um, those are the type of things that need to be done. We, once we get those in place, um, you know, move forward from there, because it's a very uh, very important situation out there. A lot of people are having struggles with their insurance, and I know you've heard the folks come forward with their with the letters um, and uh, a lot of the emails and whatnot. So, but uh, again, very good event took place, a uh, very good dialogue. Um, and so let's see, Middle Creek Restoration yesterday, um, we had that meeting and uh, basically really glad that we got that five-year extension. Uh, well, that's one of the discussions we talked about. Also um, engaging with uh, Army Corps of Engineers and some of their legal talks about some of the things that uh, will work out in one of the uh, parcels that we're dealing with, well, a couple of the parcels we're dealing with with uh, the uh, fee to trust situation. And so we're, we're uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, you know uh, some of that dialogue will come back and we can get moving in a more partnership or co cooperation so that that way um, Army Corps can come come back and say yes we can move forward and it's not going to affect this and that or whatever but again still waiting on them so um, that so that was that meeting um, let's see tomorrow agenda review um, and then um, I will be going meeting next oh there no agenda review. Okay, sorry. It's on our calendar. Yeah, it's it's right here. So I wrote. It. Okay, so um, that, that I'll be going to Nylander Park. Um, um, Poet laureate uh, Georgina Guardado. Uh, she's been working on a situation in Nylander Park where she put up the uh, the poet library, little little miniature poet library. It got cut down for whatever reason. Um, of course, that's one of the issues we're having in most of our parks is people like to vandalize, go there and uh, stay and do. All sorts of things that uh, the parks weren't designed for. However, um, with that, uh, Brian Powers has uh, contacted uh, Georgina, and we're going to see if we can get that back up, get it in there, and uh, hopefully serve uh, serve that purpose. And so I, uh, I, you know, I want to thank, give a good thanks to both of them for that. She's all, they've also been engaging with some of the folks in Clear Lake Oaks, and so I think that's a, that's going to be a good thing to 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 put up because that's one of the things when people vandalize go back and put it up or you go and paint over or you go and you know it's always that because once you stay um, once you stay vigilant and you stay on those things um, eventually and hopefully yeah right <laughs> so um, with that um, after that I'll be attending the earth meeting um, that's at 4 p.m. at the uh, Moose Lodge um, and then uh, after that I usually go to the CSA out in Spring Valley Thursday the safer meeting is uh, in the morning um, Lake County Visioning Forum health committee because there's different three different uh, committees amongst the visioning forum and so I'm part of the health group will be meeting and then uh, legislative legislative call-in uh, Friday Ag Venture and I'm also gonna have to mix in the cannabis ad hoc uh, advisory committee from RCRC and I'm gonna need to because last time I, I missed it during Ag <laughs> during the Ag Venture but I'm gonna have to be a part of that one because uh, there's specific and important discussions and policy that's uh, discussed during those committees so that, that way RCRC can go forward to the state uh, legislators advocate for us uh, rural counties that way we can get some things done get some uh, legislation passed that can help us with some of our illicit grows and all sorts of other things uh, pertaining around to that so um, let's see Saturday Fall Fest uh, it's homecoming in Upper Lake this week so uh, there, there's that and uh, they're tying in the Fall Fest with that so we'll be attending that in Upper Lake uh, you know on downtown Upper Lake so that'll be a, a really fun event to have they've been planning it for a, a long time um, so yeah Katie DeVries and uh, I think it's Ben Gwenther they, they run the, um, the, the Upper Lake Grocery they got it from Pat uh, 
And so, uh, so they've been heading this deal, and so is the, the, the Upper Lake, I think it's like a town council. It's not the town council worth, it's their own council that works on some of these things uh, for uh, community engagement and whatnot. So anyhow, um, that'll be taking place Saturday, Tuesday, uh, let's see, no, Thursday we have, the, I don't know if you've been notified about this, but Wood Woodland Community College is having their, I think it's 50th anniversary, and I've been invited to that, so I RSVP'd and figured I'd go down to that and be a part of it. Um, of course, uh, Supervisor Simon mentioned the October 15th elders meeting, so I think we're, 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 we were asked to be like co, um, uh, what do they call that, uh, we'll be, we'll be, be uh, MCs or whatever you want to call it, yeah, so um, we'll be doing that, um, let's see, Monday, no, celebrate, no, no, uh, Monday meeting after that I'll have with the CAO, Community Divisioning Forum, and then back here on Tuesday for the Board of Supervisors meeting. So with that, we'll go ahead and uh, go to uh, closed, uh, let's see, uh, closed session. Um, 8.1, conference with legal counsel, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9D2E1, potential case. With that, uh, we'll go into closed session.